Number 10, Hanam's baths. Bathing and hygiene are super important. At least that's what my mom tells me. That's why I do my best to shower more than once a week. I'm a man, and I can change if I have to, I guess. Well, baths were actually important to the Mughals as well, being that their heritage was a mix of Asiatic, Euro, Indian, they took a little from everything, and part of that was the Persian baths. The Persian baths were just one of those things they took, called hamans. I hope I'm saying that right. They were social spaces to have baths, stay clean. It was very important back then. Now, bear in mind, if you will, I know some folks at home have issues with public pools because, well, you know, they're, they're full of nastiness and, well, you'd be right, but today we have things to fight that. Imagine sharing bath water with the entire city and no one is wearing swim trunks. There's no chlorine pucks, vaccines are at least a thousand years away, and diseases are rampant. Oh, and there's no toilet paper. Jump in, kids, the water's fine, it's nice and fun. Can you imagine? Imagine if I was in the water, you wouldn't want that. That's no good, that's gross. Ew, ew. Number nine, Babber the writer. I can relate to this quite a lot, actually. So Babur, the mighty warrior and king who brought upon the Mughal Empire, was a man to be respected. Or else it could wind you up in some serious trouble. I'd say hot water, but it's more like stinky bath water. However, while on the outside he was a super tough macho man, on the inside he was a softer, kinder man who not only enjoyed writing, but was also quite the socialite, just like myself. I like, I like going to parties and meeting people, I like, I like making friends. He loved his inner self so much that he started writing his own autobiography. It started the trend of it, actually. His was called Babernama. Good name, I like it. And it detailed major events from his life. On the outside, Adam may look like a nerd, but on the inside, he's one of my dearest friends. I love Adam, he's a great guy. See, there's something nice. Usually we say something rude, but I said something nice this time. He's a great guy. Number eight, Akbar's tolerance. Medieval times, it's safe to say that these times became to be known for their religious persecution. That's kind of how it went. Queen Mary made a career out of burning heretics. Slightly disagree with my church Protestant, even though our overall arcing beliefs are founded in Christianity. And the only thing that separates us is a list of beliefs that really we can work together on? I don't think so. Away with these heretics. Yeah, that's kind of silly. Well, all long-winded jokes aside, for being a medieval king, Akbar was actually very tolerant of others' religious beliefs. This tolerance of others' beliefs actually aided the Mughal Empire in expanding to other sovereign areas of India, making them a lot stronger than they really should have been. Number seven, the melting pot. Okay, so it's late at night and you haven't been grocery shopping in over a week. Guilty. You're too lazy to get up and get groceries, and you work early tomorrow anyway. Ugh, sucks. However, you're also too motivated, or cheap, to not order takeout, so that's when you raid the cupboard like a teenager looking for munchy Pop-Tarts. You know the feeling. You start throwing everything in a pan and seeing what sticks, throwing in spices that you haven't used in a month. After all, it's said and done, you're left with, well, Whatever the heck that is. The verdict though, is actually pretty good. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the Mughal Empire's religious melting pot of religions. I said it twice, but it makes sense. Another point to add here is Akbar's acceptance of other religious values was him coming up with his own called Din In Lanahi, which was the best part of Islam, Hinduism, and other smaller religions in the area. You'd be surprised how well those work together. Number six, Shah Jahan's reign. A lot of times throughout history, the Mughal Empire kind of gets looked over. Most likely because of British invasion and because, well, the British took all their loot and art and uh, national treasures and they're sitting comfortably somewhere in a British museum. But you're not getting them back, they're ours now. But that's the point. The Mughal Empire was no joke. And at one point in history, may or may not have been the wealthiest empire on earth. A center for writing, arts, crafts, and treasures. They had the highest GDP in the world at one point. That's pretty impressive. Makes sense in how they could afford to build places like the Taj Mahal that apparently change color three times a day because of the sun and its pure white construction. Makes a lot of sense when you add it up. Number five, enlisted bear. During World War II, a Polish army unit enlisted a real life Syrian brown bear named Wojciech to serve with them, because yeah, what could go wrong, right? I just watched that bear movie, I don't know. Wojtek had been found as a cub in Iran by Polish soldiers, and of course adopted as their very own mascot. Again, sure, why not? 
Now, as he grew up, Washtek became an integral part of the unit, right? He helped carry around ammunition and other heavy supplies that only a bear could carry. Fair, I guess. And he quickly became popular among the soldiers. They all loved him. They would play with him and feed him cigarettes and beer. You named it. He loved it all. He'd eat the glass, probably. He even learned how to salute, a skill he would often perform when given um, a bottle of beer. He's like, thank you, sir. Psst and he'd open it on his nails. So scary, so scary. Washtek's presence helped boost the morale of soldiers and he became a beloved symbol of the unit's fighting spirit because why of course he did. After the war, Washtek was demobilized along with the rest of the unit and then he spent the rest of his life at the Edinburgh Zoo in Scotland where he continued to be a, of course, popular attraction. He's like still saluting people and stuff. They're like, it's all good, man, it's all good. You're safe now, you can chill. Today, he's still celebrated as a symbol of the bond between animals and humans and times of war. That's crazy. They got a real life bear to do that. It's terrifying. I just watched a movie about a bear doing some crazy stuff with some illicit substances and it seemed way scarier than that somehow. Number four, Violet Jessup. Violet Jessup was a British ocean liner stewardess who somehow survived three major shipwrecks in the early 20th century. Not one, not two, three. That's crazy. She's known for all these incredible tales of survival and her courage in the face of disaster, again, numerous times. First off, 1912, Jessup was working on board the RMS Titanic when it of course hit an iceberg and sank in the North Atlantic Ocean. She managed to escape on one of the lifeboats, one of the few lifeboats, might I add, and survived the disaster. Just a few years later, 1916, she was working on the HMS Britannic when it struck a mine and sank in the Aegean Sea. Again, Jessup survived and managed to make it to safety. Somehow. Now at this point you're like, okay, she's not gonna do it a third time, right? No possible way. In 1940, Jessup was working on board the RMS Queen Mary when it too collided with another ship and suffered significant damage. So once again, Jessup survived another disaster and went on to work another ocean liner for many years. Yeah, she still worked on ocean liners after all three of those. She's like, oh, it is what it is. Like what? Are you kidding me? Jessup's incredible tale of survival has of course made her a legendary figure in the history of ocean travel and a symbol of courage and resilience in the face of disaster. I'm baffled by this, that's crazy. You think after the second one, you definitely quit, right? Incredible, incredible. Number three, the Dybbuk box. <sighs> I don't like haunted items. This one here, definitely a haunted item. My ears are draining as I'm doing this, so I'm like, ah. It's getting louder all of a sudden. This small wine cabinet got some attention after being sold on eBay back in 2003. Yeah, remember eBay? Me either. The box was purchased by Kevin Manis. Now, shortly after, he claimed that said box was haunted and it caused him and his family to experience a series of horrifying events and health problems. And of course, paranormal activity. How do you sell that, eh? Hey, want this? <laughs> no, not at all. Sounds like it's a terrible idea. He eventually sold the box to Jason Haxton, who ended up writing a book about his experience. Yeah, it was that bad. Some believe that opening this box can release malevolent spirits into the world. Now, its origins here go back to a woman who survived World War II. This box came from her estate. So the history behind it, it's dark and it's seen some days, that's for sure. And now it lives at the Haunted Museum, rightfully so. Remember that viral video of Post Malone touching this random haunted artifact? That was this box, that was the same one. Now he's falling off stage and stuff. No, no idea what's going on with Post. Zach Baggins, please keep an eye on this box. Thank you so much. Hit that thumbs up for ghost proof glass. We really like that. It's the same glass they used in the movie 13 Ghosts. They just have that around the Dybbuk box. Matthew Lillard watches it the whole time. It's lovely. Number two, Pompeii eruption. Let's hope this one doesn't happen again, cause hot. Once a flourishing Roman city located near the Bay of Naples in Italy, that was, of course, until 79 AD when Mount Vesuvius decided, eh, I'm gonna explode. I'm gonna go off and bury the entire city and all its inhabitants under layers and layers of ash and pumice. How scary and horrible is that? The eruption was so powerful that it wiped out all life within a 16 mile radius. Yeah, it makes you think about Yellowstone National Park a bit, doesn't it? Earth is terrifying. She does some random shit. Pompeii remained buried and forgotten for almost 1700 years until it was rediscovered in 1748. Today, Pompeii is, honestly, it's amazing. It's an archeological site that offers a glimpse into ancient Roman life with well-preserved ruins of homes public buildings, streets, artwork, you name it. There's a restaurant that's open now. They reopened a restaurant they found buried. That's incredible. And there's also a great amount of people who steal from this ancient landmark because 
Humans are so stupid. Yeah, how to get cursed. This is how you do it. Listen up. Tourists would steal fragments of monuments, literally pieces of the city. They would pull out and then put it in their pocket. Yeah, put a little bit of Rome and take it home on our flight. And then put out my lovely fireplace there. That's great. A hundred packages a year will get sent back to the archeological superintendents, most of them being accompanied with a letter explaining all the bad luck that occurred after they took the piece. Yeah, don't take haunted pieces of Rome home with you. Don't take Rome home. That's what they should say. I'm gonna make a shirt and say, it's because they don't take Rome home. Everyone's like, what does that even mean? I'm like, ah, watch the video. I don't know, there's a QR code on the back, scan it. And finally, number one, James Dean's haunted car. James Dean's love for fast cars was well known, but sadly, because one of them was um, haunted. Apparently, let's talk about that one. One of these cars ultimately led to his tragic death at the age of 24, but some are now convinced that all of his cars were cursed in some way, shape, or form. There's a, a car curse, if you want to call it that. Dean's first vehicle was a Triumph Tiger T1 10 motorcycle. Now it was involved in an accident that left him with a broken leg, which where I'm about to go with things is not bad considering. His next car, a Porsche 550 Spider, is the one that he famously died in after colliding head on with another vehicle, much worse than a broken leg, in my opinion. Now that's already tragic enough. That's dark history right there. Could probably end the point. But after Dean's death, things happened. Afterwards, the Porsche was sold off and quickly became infamous for causing more accidents and more weird deaths. One of its owners even reported seeing the ghost of James Dean sitting in the passenger seat shortly before they crashed. That's really jarring. That's probably, that would make me crash. If I saw that beside me, I'd be like, okay, let's see you later. Now that car disappeared from public view in the late 1960s and has since been rumored to be hidden away by some collector who believes it to be cursed, so. Great, out of sight, out of mind, we love that. Another Porsche that James Dean owned was destroyed when it caught fire while being transported by a trailer. So two haunted cars. But a third Porsche that he'd ordered never made it to him because it was involved in an accident during transportation that killed that driver. So whether you believe in curses or not, there's no denying that James Dean's car collection has some dark, tragic history. Something's going on there, for sure. I don't have my license, and you know what? After that last point, I'm walking everywhere, that's it. I'm just speed walking everywhere with that big goofy belt. That's it. None of this. Just this. That's <laughs> so stupid. Number 10. John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep. Google it up, it's actually terrifying and very real. Apparently cases studied by Mac and abduction sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out, it's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon, we've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually, this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen, literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying, you gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophia's coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings in cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. 
He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. Flowerdew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem Witch Trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified in 1976 and the following year in 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, a Sunny Amusement Museum of Crime ticket, a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money. In our number five spot today, we have The Wave. On January 15th, 1919 in Boston, there was a huge, massive storage tank that was filled to the brim with molasses. Okay, we're talking about 2.3 million gallons of this stuff sitting in this tank. And on that day, the tank broke and set a 15 foot tall wave of sticky gooey syrup flowing throughout the city. I panic when I have like a tablespoon of that stuff because it's so sticky and goopy. I can't imagine the sight of 2.3 million gallons coming crashing down. Someone wrote about how the molasses wave hit houses in the area saying that they quote seemed to cringe up as though they were made of pasteboard. Well this story sounds like really silly and wacky. Oh my gosh it's molasses. It was actually very deadly. Not only did the wave trap and then kill most of the laborers that were nearby, but there were others in the area who lost their lives as well. In the end, it is estimated that about 150 people were injured in this accident, and 21 people lost their lives. It is estimated that on the day of the accident, the molasses was moving at about 35 miles per hour. That would be genuinely terrifying. You can't run away from it. You can't escape into a house. There's literally nothing you can do except for try and surf this massive wave of molasses. In the end, after a ton of lawsuits, it was decided that the company was to blame for the accident because their inspections of the tank weren't thorough enough. There were about 100 settlements made out of court and the company ended up paying somewhere from 500,000 to a million dollars in the end, which is about $16.1 million in today's money. In our number four spot today, we have the Belgian Congo. 
Congo. This was a period of colonial rule by Belgium in the Congo from 1885 to 1960. During this time, the Belgian government exploited the natural resources of the Congo, particularly rubber, ivory, and minerals, through the use of forced labor and brutal violence. Congolese people were forced to work long hours under harsh conditions, and they were punished severely if they failed to meet production quotas. The Belgian government also used violent repression to maintain control over the Congolese people, with estimates of millions of Congolese deaths during this period. The Congo's wealth was exploited for the benefit of the Belgian colonizers and the international economy, with little to no benefit to the Congolese people. The exploitation and violence of the Belgian Congo has had a lasting impact on the country and its people, and the scars of the period are still felt today. In our number 3 spot today, we have St. Bryce's Day. St. Bryce's Day was a dark event that occurred in England on November 13th, 1002, when King Ethelred the Unready ordered the slaying of all Danes living in England. The order was given in response to Viking raids on England, and it resulted in the deaths of thousands of people. The massacre was particularly brutal as people were killed in their homes and churches, and many were burned alive. The Danes had been living in England for generations, and many had converted to Christianity and were assimilated into English society, and the massacre had a very significant impact on Anglo-Danish relations, and it led to a long period of conflict between England and Denmark. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Partition of India. The Partition of India was a major event that occurred in 1947, resulting in the division of British India into two separate countries, India and Pakistan. The Partition was based on religious lines, with India being predominantly Hindu and Pakistan being predominantly Muslim. The decision to divide the country was made by the British government, and it led to widespread violence, displacement, and loss of life. Millions of people were forced to leave their homes and move to the other side of the border, leading to one of the largest mass migrations in human history. Estimates of the death toll range from 200,000 to 2 million people. The partition also created long-standing tensions between India and Pakistan, including disputes over territory, resources, and religious identity. Entity. The legacy of the partition continues to shape politics and society in South Asia today. And finally, in our number one spot, we have the year 536. For this one, we are taking it pretty far back, all the way to year 536, because this is widely regarded as the worst year to have been alive. In modern times, a lot of our terrible things that have happened and terrible times we have lived through have been because of the things that we as humans do, as evidenced by all of the horrific things we've talked about so far. This was of course still the case in 536 as well, but they faced something much larger in this year that truthfully wasn't anyone's fault at all. In 536, there was one of the worst global famines in human history because there was a lack of sunlight at the time. The earth used to be a very different place, and during these times there were a series of large volcanic eruptions which sent volcanic ash into the air, thus blocking the light of the sun. This effectively dropped the temperature of the earth, so people had to live in the cold for 18 months, and many people ended up passing away due to starvation, famine, and cold. This, coupled with the brutal conflicts that could be seen in many parts of the world at the time, it totally makes sense that this year would be regarded as one of the worst in all of history. Number 10. Cursed Trumpets King Tut's trumpets are a pair that were found in the burial chamber of the 18th dynasty pharaoh upon discovery. One silver and one bronze. The oldest operational trumpets in the world and the only known surviving examples from ancient Egypt. Both are engraved with images of the gods and both were silent for more than 3,000 years before the trumpets were played for 150 million people live on a BBC broadcast in 1939. And then World War II happened. Yeah, because apparently the curator of the Tut collection at the Egypt Museum says whenever they're played, a war occurs. Yeah. The bronze trumpet was stolen from the museum in Cairo during the looting riots of 2011, and then hilariously enough, returned two weeks later. Yeah, apparently Buddy didn't like the ancient gods just roaming his condo. Uh, you think? Number 9. Annabelle. The most infamous and dangerous possessed doll in the world. Yeah, pretty well all you need to know about that. Found at the home of the Warren's Occult Museum in Connecticut, we know a little bit about this doll with all the films about her. She rests inside a glass case marked WARNING, POSITIVELY DO NOT TOUCH. Aggressive, but necessary. Gifted to a nursing student from a thrift store in the 70s, incidents involving levitating onto the table and running around at night, she took the doll to a medium who said it was possessed by a little girl who had passed. 
Ed and Lorraine were called shortly after and they offered to take it to their home. On the way home, Ed said that the doll was making the car do funny things. Swerving, no power steering, brake checks, haunted, haunted, yeah. The museum unfortunately shut down in 2019, but the cursed objects seem to be staying put, which the owners even refuse to make eye contact with. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, I would definitely Ronaldo that thing across the room if it was running around my apartment 2 a.m. Just field goal it right out the window. Number eight, Travis Walton. The horrifying abduction of Arizona forester Travis Walton. This is my favorite alien abduction case, yet the scariest, hands down. Fire in the Sky, filmed in 1993, does a pretty bang up job at what happened that night. In 1975, Walton and a logging crew were working in the National Forest. Him and six of his coworkers encountered a saucer-shaped craft feet away from their truck, making a high-pitched tone. The curious Walden was then blasted by a light beam and apparently abducted into their ship. The men were terrified and drove off immediately. Walden claims that he then woke up in a hospital room on board, observed by three short, bald creatures, before fighting tirelessly and losing consciousness. He remembers nothing else until he found himself awake, walking along a highway five days later, naked, just wandering the highway in a daze. He's had tons of interviews. Guy was definitely taken. He's also so peaceful about it too. He's just convinced that they tried to heal him from the accidental blast. I check your organs and your pineal gland. Just make sure they're all there and intact, you know? Holy moly. Number seven, werewolves of London. Real werewolves. In the 80s, Lorraine and Ed Warren traveled in search of a real life wolf man. Apparently they were watching a TV show following the life of a local werewolf, Bill Ramsey in London, England, and Lorraine felt a strange connection to him. After a quick trip to London for more answers, she found Bill's whereabouts. Unlike usual werewolf folklore, he didn't transform every full moon and he didn't get bit. Bill Ramsey was apparently possessed by an evil wolf spirit. That's right. It was so bad that he needed a full-blown exorcism. The Warrens brought Bill back to Connecticut to meet Bishop Robert McKenna, and the exorcism was a success. Thanks to everyone involved that day, Bill lives a pretty normal life now, very unpossessed. Yeah, I'd hope so. This is terrifying. Imagine that's your neighbor. Yeah, sometimes I change into a werewolf once in a blue moon. I'm Bill, nice to meet you, welcome to the neighborhood. This is a fruitcake. Number six, Osiris. Yet again, something stolen that's very, very old. Why do people steal the oldest, most cursed stuff? The infamous statue of Osiris. In 1971, during an excavation in Saqqara, Egyptologist Walter Brian Emery found a small statue of the Egyptian god of death, Osiris. Emery took the statue of Osiris and once at his house, Emery went to the bathroom to shower. After a few moments, apparently his assistant heard Emery screaming in fear. He found him clutching the sink, scared to death and paralyzed. Emery was diagnosed with paralysis of the right side of his body and was unable to speak. He died the following day. Uh, yeah, talk about a curse of the pharaohs. Like, buddy, you can't just steal stuff and then just throw it up overseas in a museum. Especially the stuff that clearly says in hieroglyphics, do not remove, this is cursed. It's pretty clear right there. Like, never steal anything ancient, you know? That's just a scary movie like waiting to happen. And now for, you guessed it, a portrait of a lady. Quite literally, that's its name, at least now. When it was painted in 1890 by Juan Luna, he named it Paz Pardo de Tavera after his wife, whom supposedly the depiction, Paz, who Juan Luna killed, possibly while still finishing the portrait, and that Juan was acquitted on grounds of temporary of insanity for doing. On September 23rd of 1892, when Paz refused to open the door of the second floor bedroom where she was with her son and her mother Juliana, Juan got his gun and after pounding on the door and Incessantly and seeing Paz's brothers coming to her rescue from across the street, he fires at Juliana and Paz, who would die from her wounds a few days later. According to legend, the painting is now possessed by the spirit of Paz, who brings misfortune upon its owners. Paz's owners have died in car crashes, been forced into bankruptcy, experienced miscarriages, among other reported sorrows. As to where the supposed curse of the portrait of a lady came from, that remains a mystery too. Did Luna, in his desperation, curse the painting? Was it the portrait present at Villa Dupont during the deaths and by some black magic imbued it with the tragedy in which it passes on to every home it find itself in since. It seems that this stunning art piece, one hard to hold the intensive gaze of, truly lives on. During the opening night at the Met Gala, the spotlight for the portrait of the lady exploded and all the other lights were fine. I will say, this is the most beautiful and enchanting painting on our countdown by a landslide. And now the story of the Martini Man. We love a creepy Reddit story, especially
especially one that can strike close to home. The reason it may do that for you is this story is about a painting by an artist who only ever really paints one thing, a martini bartender, over and over. They're all slightly different, but they're not impossible to find or come across, I've actually seen them myself. The story goes that five guys move into a college house together, buying furniture and decor. One roommate brings home this painting. I hate it. Zero out of ten. Frat boys have the worst decor taste, as always. Most of them felt weird about it right away, validly so, as activity started fast for them. Apparently you could feel or even sometimes see its eyes follow you, feel a presence or touches on your arms. After a month it escalates to doors slamming and aggressive knocking. Footsteps can be heard walking in the kitchen and then suddenly in the upstairs hallway or running up and down the stairs. One of the roommates moves out and takes the painting with him and figured he'd donate it to the bar he works at. Then they apparently also experienced paranormal activity and ended up throwing it out. As mentioned, if you research the artist will refuse, it shows that he actually paints a lot of the same thing over and over and it always involves some sort of ventriloquist looking person with different variations of this bartender cooking photo. The one you see on screen is the one our storyteller feels to be the most similar to the one they had owned. Up next we have our Rain Woman. This is a paranormal story classic so you may know it. It starts six months prior to the creation of the painting in 1996 when artist Svetlana Telets felt like she was being constantly watched. One day she's sitting in front of a blank canvas when a clear vision of the final painting appeared to her after some artist block. Feeling as if someone was controlling her hand, she sketched the composition for five hours and then spent another month refining the details. After displaying it in a local art salon, multiple people successively bought her painting, only to return it to the seller after describing a figure following them in their homes and their dreams. Owners who bought this painting reported insomnia, fear, unexplained sadness, and even the feeling of being watched while in the vicinity of the painting. One temporary owner described white eyes appearing everywhere he looked and returned the painting with an offer to pay back half of the purchase price, fearing he might drown in the eyes if he kept it for any longer. The piece was eventually purchased by a musician named Sergei Skepkov in 2008, though reportedly his wife later hid the painting after seeing ghostly figures walk around their apartment at night. The Cursed Paintings of Ashil Gorky This isn't even one painting either. This guy was popping out cursed paintings like bunnies. The paintings of Ashil Gorky created between 1904 and 1938 are long since rumored to be cursed, with paintings reportedly falling from walls, catching on fires, and owners being visited by a black haired ghost in a blue overcoat. In one case on March 1st of 1962, a plane with 87 passengers, 8 crew members, and 15 abstract paintings by Gorky crashed into a swamp two minutes after takeoff, killing everyone on board and destroying the paintings. Ashil Gorky was an Armenian painter who from 1946 suffered a series of tragic events. His studio burnt down, he underwent a colostomy for cancer, leaving him traumatized and also handicapped. And then his wife had an affair with his closest friend, artist Roberto Mata. He broke his neck and his painting arm in a car accident the same week his wife leaves him, taking their children with her. Now left partially paralyzed and alone, surrounded by dozens of paintings he had finished or now could no longer finish, Gorky took his own life in his art studio when he was 44. The artist and his mother is said to be his most haunted piece. The atmosphere around it deeply depressing and nauseating, reportedly leaving viewers and owners in dangerous mindsets. According to Anthony Holslag, a researcher studying the aftermath of Armenian genocides, the painter's work has come to symbolize everything we lost for many Armenian survivors, as well as offering identity and a source of strength. And now, last on our list is Ivan the Terrible and his son Ivan. This is a potent piece of artwork. Look at the disparity, the grandeur. This is a massive painting, insanely detailed and elaborate. The harsh contrast of light and dark with the emphasized jewel tones of the carpet, I could ramble forever. This truly is a masterpiece, especially when looking upon the faces of the Ivans. See, painter Ilya Repin was the most renowned artist of Russia's 19th century for his realism. His position in the art world was comparable to that of Leo Tolstoy in literature. The ways in which he captured expressions, complexion, texture, and detail is remarkable. But that meant Repin had been working a lot, and after constant tiredness, his right arm started hurting. He had had to stop working for a while and became deeply depressed as a result. Some people said it happened after he did the famous painting in 1885, rumoring it cursed from harboring too much of his pain, as well as true human emotion in its expressions to not become its own living entity. While this painting was exhibited in the Tretkovoy Gallery, it had an ununderstandable effect to its visitors. Some of them were getting anxiety attacks or were starting to cry. Some were nauseous and many fled the room that the painting took up. Skeptics say it could be due to its realistic look, as even the blood looks real after all. I think it's Ivan the Terrible's eyes. Another incident is 
when Abram Balashov, a Russian icon painter, saw the canvas for the first time, he snapped the picture and cut at it while screaming, Stop the bloodshed. He was sent to a psychiatric care facility after that incident. Then on May 25th of 2018, the painting was attacked and damaged with a metal pole. Igor Podporin, the man who had attacked the painting, specifically came to see Rapin's Ivan the Terrible in the gallery. He told the police that he wanted to leave, but then dropped into the buffet and drank 100 grams of vodka. I don't drink vodka, and I became overwhelmed by something. There's also a legend about Rapin's models dying. Musogorsky, Pisemsky, Piero Grove, actor Mercy Dars Hanto, and even Fedor Tichiev died as soon as Rapin began to paint their portraits. Even the Prime Minister Stolopin was shot in Kiev after Rapin painted his portrait. So maybe in this case, the man is more cursed than the actual art. Number 10, Animal Heaven. This was pretty odd, and we're still talking about it, rightfully so. Coco the Gorilla, she was a famous primate known for her ability to communicate through sign language. We've all seen that video with her and Robin Williams tickling each other laughing. It's heartbreaking, it's beautiful. Gorillas are very smart and very strong, so strong. Francine Patterson, who was Coco's trainer and of course the closest human around to Coco, was asked in an interview how deep their conversations with Coco would actually go. The caregiver showed Coco a skeleton once and asked if it is alive or dead. Coco signed, dead, draped. Draped means covered up. Then they asked, where do animals go when they die? And then Coco said, apparently Coco said, a comfortable hole. And then she gave a kiss goodbye. Yeah, philosophical debates followed, of course, because what was she referring to here? Was Coco being referred to being put into the ground, literally? Or was she talking about an afterlife? A comfortable hole in the afterlife world? I don't know. Girls are so smart, and again, so strong. Number nine, Derek Amato. What started with tragedy ended in symphony. Here we go, I had no idea this was possible, and now I'm questioning everything. Derek Amato is a self-taught pianist who gained worldwide attention after a traumatic brain injury caused him to develop acquired Savin syndrome. Derek was diving into a shallow pool back in 2006. Now his concussion actually made him lose some of his hair and some of his memory, it was bad. But in a bizarre turn of events after the accident, Derek became musical genius. Guy was killer on the keys, who knew? This condition allowed him to access exceptional music abilities that were for sure not around before the accident. Amato actually released his own album titled Life in the Keys. That's incredible, I've tried so many times. Number eight, Katolan. A Mongol princess and descendant of Genghis Khan. Let's talk about her. Katolan is known in history for her undefeated wrestling abilities. If you can say that. She was said to have issued a challenge to any man who wanted to marry her, stating that the first must defeat her in a wrestling match. Now, despite many attempts by many, many men, Katolan reportedly remained undefeated, with some accounts suggesting she won as many as 10,000 matches. Yeah, tender, but make it exhausting, sure. Instead of a super swipe, she's giving your leg swipes. I don't know. A super choke? Her story has become a legendary tale of strength and independence in Mongolian history. And also, how terrifying is that woman? Imagine being like number 6,000. You're like, I don't think I'm gonna do it. I don't think I'm gonna tap her out. I really have no clue. Uh, number seven, Hector. I'm not referring to the Greek hero Hector. No, not this time, not, not this time, Bumblebee. No, I'm referring to the cloud that was named after him. Yeah, we're talking about clouds now because eh, why not? Hector is a famous cloud formation that appears in the Tiwi Islands of Australia. Now the cloud appears from September to March every single year, every single day, which is terrifying. What's going on here? The area's unique weather patterns are quite the spectacle. The name Hector's Thunderstorm, or simply Hector, which I'm more fond of, that name also comes from a powerful storm that struck the area back in 1930s. A World War II pilot named it Hector, and that's how memorable it was. It's still going strong today. Yeah, today, even right now, I guess, yeah, Hector is still going. Tomorrow, Hector's gonna disappear. It's the last day to catch Hector. It's right now. Go get your last minute views on Hector. That's crazy, I didn't realize that was today. At this point, he's a popular tourist attraction. Visitors can go and take boat tours to witness the spectacular lightning displays surrounding the storm. Me, personally, I want nothing to do with that. I watched Nope recently, so, no, this one freaked me out. I don't like clouds that show up on the regular. I don't know. Clouds with a schedule? I'm all set. This next one here, kind of the same kind of thing. Here we go. Number six, medieval sky battle. This might happen soon. I don't know. 
aliens, who knows? Short and sweet, this one. This looks like the inside of my old high school locker, first of all, but this is actually medieval art. This Nuremberg broadsheet shows us a battle, an Avengers level threat, really, if anything. This battle took place apparently on April 14th, 1561. It was an aerial battle involving, I don't know, globes, crosses, tubes, you tell me. I don't know what's going on in the sky, but Iron Man is nowhere to be found. These cigar shaped UFOs have been breaking the internet recently, and I'm not gonna lie, they kind of look like what we're seeing in that medieval art. Maybe this is the same vehicle. Maybe it's the same battle. Maybe it's gonna happen again. People viewed this event as a divine warning. Yeah, obviously, you don't say. What else are you gonna call that? UFO is flying around. Someone's like, I have a bad feeling, Abraham. I don't know, this looks a little odd. In our number five spot today, we have Stephen Griffiths. This is a person who is said to have idolized the Yorkshire Ripper. So I'm sure what comes next will be no surprise. Stephen was a PhD student who wanted to achieve fame, but through the most sinister way possible. Between June of 2009 and May of 2010, he would go on to take the lives of three separate women. His criminal history was also extremely concerning, as years ago, he had been arrested due to an unprovoked attack on a grocery store manager, and it is said that he previously stated that he saw himself becoming a serial Shortly after he was arrested for his crimes, CCTV footage emerged that showed him celebrating after taking the life of his final victim. The footage showed him holding up a crossbow and giving the finger directly to the camera. It is said that Stephen pled guilty to his crimes once caught, not because he was remorseful, but because he wanted to receive the recognition for them. In our number four spot today, we have Joanna Denny. This is the person responsible for a series of killings and attacks that took place in March of 2013. Joanna is a very cold and very heartless person person and has, on many occasions, been said to laugh at her crimes and the lives she took, even still behind bars. After the first of her crimes, authorities launched a manhunt for her and they used CCTV footage to help track her down. She was finally caught after attacking two dog walkers who, thanks to immediate medical intervention, were able to survive. There are many, many things about this story that make it exceptionally chilling, and it seems as though most people Joanna encounters are left with quite an impression of what a horrible person she really is. On the day she was sentenced, it is reported that the judge, Mr. Justice Spencer, said, quote, although you pleaded guilty, you've made it quite clear you have no remorse. He went on to say, quote, you are a cruel, calculating, selfish, and manipulative serial after this, he sentenced her to a whole life order, or life in prison without parole, and it is said that she smiled and laughed at this. Since her time in prison, she is said to have planned escape attempts that involved the killing of a prison guard and other terrifying ideas. In our number three spot today, we have Elizabeth Wetlaufer. Elizabeth is a former registered nurse and serial who is responsible for taking the lives of eight and attempting to take the lives of another six senior citizens who were under her care. With a total of 14 victims that either passed away or were harmed by her actions, she is now one of the worst serial killers Canada has ever seen. And not to mention how she was doing these things to vulnerable people that she was supposed to have devoted her life to taking care of. Her first victim who passed away was James Silcox, who was 84 in 2007 and was a World War II veteran. She committed her crime by injecting insulin into her patients. In September of 2016, Liz ended up entering herself into a drug rehabilitation program at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, which is located here in Toronto. It was here that she ended up confessing to her horrific crimes. Of course, the staff at the hospital notified the proper authorities, and she was subsequently arrested, and she gave police a two-hour confession. She admitted to knowing what she did was wrong, but she also just said that she had urges she couldn't control. She stated that quote, God or the devil or whatever wanted me to do it. In the end, she was sentenced to life in prison, but because of the way that the Canadian system works, she will at some point be eligible for parole and hopefully denied, all right? In our number two spot today, we have Kevin Davis. The story behind this killer is truly one of the most disturbing things I have ever heard in my entire life. Kevin Davis was 18 years old when he took the life of his own mother. It seems as though there was some sort of conversation beforehand that had made him upset, which of course is never a good Good enough reason to do something like this, but there are details about this crime I wish that I could just unlearn. In an interview with police, he gives them an extremely detailed account of basically everything that happened and seems to show absolutely no remorse at all. It is chilling, it is disgusting, and it is honestly just horrific. During his trial, a doctor did testify to say that he had a personality disorder, but that he also fully knew the difference between right and wrong, and knew that his crime was wrong, and that there were no medical diagnosis that 
could justify his actions. Kevin is still in jail where he will most likely spend the rest of his life, but he will become eligible for parole in 2044. Finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Axeman of New Orleans. Unfortunately, this is not the name of some terrible horror flick, and instead it's the moniker given to a terrible, unidentified serial this person was active in New Orleans, Louisiana and its surrounding areas from May of 1918 to October 1919. As the name implies, those who were targeted by this person were usually attacked with an axe and it usually was one that actually belonged to the victims themselves. Many people believe that this person may have been targeting people of Italian descent because this was a theme among the victims and some also believe that he was mainly targeting women and only took the lives of men when they tried to intervene. This is actually somewhat supported by the homes where women were killed but men weren't. In the end, although this person is responsible for taking at least 12 lives, exactly who the Axeman is or was remains a mystery. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Holodomor. This event was a man-made famine that took place in Ukraine from 1932 to 1933 and was orchestrated by the Soviet government under the leadership of Joseph Stalin. It was a deliberate policy to force Ukrainian farmers to give up their crops to the Soviet Soviet government in exchange for fixed prices that were often below market rates. Stalin intended to break the resistance of the Ukrainian peasantry to Soviet collectivization and to suppress Ukrainian nationalism. As a result, an estimated three to seven and a half million Ukrainians died from starvation during the famine. Despite the scale of the tragedy, the Soviet government denied that the famine was happening and prevented food aid from reaching Ukraine. This event is considered by many to be an intentional slang as it targeted the Ukraine Ukrainian people specifically and was carried out with the intention of causing mass death. It is a tragic example of the devastating consequences of totalitarianism and government control over food supplies. In our number 9 spot today we have the Spanish Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition was a campaign launched by the Spanish government in the late 15th century to eliminate heresy in Spain. The Inquisition was established to root out converts to Christianity who were secretly practicing their original faith as well as to identify and punish Jewish people who had converted to Christianity but were still suspected of adhering to their original religion. The Inquisition used torment, forced confessions, and executions to suppress what was considered heresy. The Spanish Inquisition continued for over three centuries and resulted in the persecution of tens of thousands of people. The exact number of those who were executed or otherwise punished is not known, but it is estimated that at least several thousand people were killed during this time. The Inquisition was a dark period in Spanish history and had a lasting impact on the country's culture and their politics. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Reign of Terror. This was a period of violence and political repression that took place during the French Revolution from 1793 to 1794. It was marked by a series of mass executions of individuals deemed to be enemies of the revolution, as well as the widespread use of terror and intimidation to suppress political opposition. The Reign of Terror was instigated by radical Jacobin faction led by Max Maximilian Robespierre, who sought to defend the revolution against perceived enemies both within and outside of France. During this time, an estimated 16,000 to 40,000 people were executed, including many who had been prominent supporters of the revolution. The reign of terror came to an end in July of 1794 when Robespierre and his closest associates were arrested and executed. The reign of terror was quite a dark chapter in French history and left a lasting legacy of fear and violence in the collective memory of the French people. In our number 7 spot today, we have the trail. The trail of blood is a term used to describe a series of killings and human rights violations committed by Brazilian cattle ranchers against indigenous people in the Amazon rainforest in the 1980s and the 1990s. The violence was driven by the expansion of the ranching industry, which required the clearing of large areas of forest for grazing land. Indigenous communities and isolated tribes who lived in these areas were often often seen as an obstacle to this expansion and were forcibly removed or killed. Many of the killings were carried out by people who were hired, known as pistoleros, and they operated with the complicity of local government officials. The violence led to the displacement of thousands of indigenous people and the destruction of their traditional way of life. The Trail of Blood has been a major issue in Brazilian politics and has sparked international outrage and calls for greater protection of indigenous rights and the Amazon rainforest. In our number 6 spot today, 
today we have the Great Chinese Famine. This famine was a catastrophic period in Chinese history that lasted from 1958 to 1962 during the leadership of Mao Zedong. The famine was the result of a series of policies including the Great Leap Forward which aimed to rapidly modernize China's economy and agriculture. These policies resulted in the collectivization of agriculture and the forced requisitioning of crops which led to a significant decrease in food production. In addition, environmental factors such as floods and droughts only exacerbated the famine. It is estimated that anywhere from 15 to 45 million people died as a result of the famine and related policies, making it one of the deadliest famines in human history. The Chinese government under Mao Zedong denied the existence of the famine and prevented food aid from reaching those in need. The Great Chinese Famine remains a tragic reminder of the devastating impact of misguided government policies on the lives of millions of people. Country roads, take me home. It's West Virginia Penitentiary. This gothic baddie definitely completes with Danvers in which looks more like a vampire's house in a Scooby Doo movie contest. But like Danvers, this beautiful exterior may pass for a mansion or castle, but it is a shell for the bitter truth within. West Virginia Penitentiary opened in 1860s and was intended to mirror the prison in Juliet, Illinois. Unfortunately, inmates were immediately crammed into tiny cells that measured 5 by 7 feet, sometimes occupied by three prisoners each. Most prisoners had been convicted of serious crimes, with the most feared inmates being locked up on the north side, dubbed the Alamo. More chillingly, inmate Paul Glenn was made to build the prison's electric chair, dubbed Old Sparky. Close to 100 people were condemned to death, either via the chair or by noose. Unsurprisingly, the prison's tough, cramped, and often brutal condition, not to mention high number of death penalty inmates, earned it a reputation as one of the harshest correctional facilities in the US. During an inmate uprising in 1973, prisoners held hostages and set fire to the prison base. Another in 1986 saw 20 inmates storm the cafeteria in protest at poor conditions. The following years had series of high profile breakouts. The prison was closed in 1995 after a court order ruled that the conditions were inhumane. Who would have guessed? This asylum is also in the Bagel City, Willard Asylum. Built in upstate New York on the bank of Seneca Lake towards the end of the 19th century, it starts off well intentioned and pretty decent. It's created around the idea of moral treatment, keeping patients clean and fed, keeping them occupied with sewing gardening and other tasks, and even dare say attempting to treat their illnesses. And while this idea was successful at first, like teenagers in love, some things ain't meant to last. Like any place in the mid 1900s, trying to handle mental illness, there were deaths. Because of most of the residents had nowhere else to go with societal rejects, and since diseases like tuberculosis and typhoid were still knocking around the building making it a quarantine, it's estimated that about half of all patients who arrived never left. But that's not the creepiest part. When the asylum was closed in the 90s, workers made a discovery in the attic. There they found 400 suitcases, carefully wrapped and labeled with the names of patients and filled with their belongings. See, the average length of a stay was around 30 years. Many of those who died didn't have any family left to claim anything, so rather than throw everything away, staff packed patients' possessions into suitcases that they had when they arrived and stored them in the attic, where they remained as a time capsule for hundreds of forgotten lives. A Lovecraftian muse, it's a blend of beauty and nightmare, it's Danvers Estate. Not only inspiration for Arkham Sanatorium, H.P. Lovecraft also mentions it in Pickman's model and the shadow over Zinn's mouth, and it's understandable why. This hospital constructed in 1887 is hella gothic. Check that out. Nice, right? Anyways, it was designed based on a mental health advocate, if you want to call them that, at the times this concept of a positive environment that meant ornate interiors, private rooms, and long, rambling wings that would let sunshine in. But while Danvers was meant to be an appealing place for whose interior promoted the health and well-being of its patients, as the decades wore on, this structure that was only meant to hold 600 patients was housing a population of 2,360 in 1939. The staff whose size had remained relatively stable was at a loss for how to control the patients who were sick and dirty from their lack of care. Visitors to the hospital in the late 1940s described the patients as aimlessly wandering the halls or vacantly staring at walls. Sometimes the patients passed away out of the staff member's sight and weren't discovered for days, rotting away in some forgotten room. Eventually all of the nightmarish trappings of the asylum were introduced, solitary confinement, straitjackets, shock therapy, and it was the birthplace of the transorbital lobotomy, a procedure that spread 
all around North America. Portions of the hospital were blocked off starting in 1969 and most of it closed by 1985. The entire campus shut down in 1992. The old Inunaki tunnel deserves its own horror franchise, let alone a video game. Deep within the mountains of Fukuoka, Japan, is the small remote village of Inunaki. A sign saying the Japanese constitution is not in effect past here hangs near the entrance of the village. The area near an old Inunaki tunnel has been considered to be haunted due to a number of killings connected to this place. The tunnel's construction was completed in 1949 and was closed when a new one was constructed in 1975. In December of 1988, the charred remains of a man were found within this closed mountain tunnel. The perpetrators of this gruesome act were five young men who had wanted to rob the man and steal his car. All were sentenced to life. In another case, a young couple in the mid 70s broke down on the roadside and went in search of help and they were confronted and killed by an old man with a sickle. The area also has a history that goes back over a thousand years as a training ground for esoteric Buddhist practitioners who claim the area to be a spiritual hotspot of lost souls. The tunnel itself has been sealed off with concrete blocks but an opening at the top of the tunnel still allows entry for anyone foolish enough to climb over. Seeing as it's no longer in use and far off the beaten path that means no assistance would be able to reach you in an emergency situation so it's highly discouraged you try anything stupid. And finally, not the Italian getaway you're looking for, the Ospedale Psichiatrico di Volatera. Man, that was hard. Dubbed the place of no return, the ruins of this hospital now lay decaying in Tuscany, Italy. Inside, there are still a few items that were left in 1978, the year the hospital was abandoned. Wheelchairs, an old telephone booth, sun beds. Founded in 1888 for the mentally ill and poor, the war did well in the early 1900s with significant development, expanding gradually with the creation of shops, services, an agricultural company, and a judicial section. Luigi Scabia's plan was to build an independent village in which patients could feel free but also rehabilitate and tailor work to each patient. This is how it goes until Luigi dies. After that, his successors over accept patients and the hospital grew to become one of the largest asylums in Italy. 6,000 people were housed in a ward at a time, with 20 sinks and 2 toilets to every 200 patients. People were sent there not only for minor emotional problems, but also for political crimes. Patients were subjected to controversial treatments such as insulin therapy and electroshock. Inmates were often sedated, isolated, or placed in tanks full of ice. The rooms had prison-like grates and the nurses were addressed as guard or as superior. Patients were even tied to their beds in straight jackets and letters from family were concealed from them. This hospital was shut down with the Basiglia law that ended the age of asylums in Italy. The walls of the hospital courtyard are still covered in carvings of a patient who was locked inside for more than a decade, starting with the painting of Maria Ivanova. So I want to start by saying I love this painting for one super noticeable reason, or at least noticeable to me, and, and that's her face. Her features and facial shapes are ones often not seen in paintings from this time. Usually the women are all looking very similar in their features, their foreheads, their complexions, even their expressions. She's got character and a realness about her that makes this painting capture a photo-like essence. Also her coy narrowed side eye, the slight smirk, she knows what's up with you. I gotta assume this Maria was a baddie. At least before she passed from tuberculosis, quite shortly after Russian artist Vladimir Borovsky painted it in 1797. In fact, it's her premature death paired with her unique candor in the painting that feed into the belief that it causes bad luck to those who look at it. That this painting had some sort of power that could cause the death to any unmarried young girl. People have blamed the painting for a bunch of tragic deaths of young girls that have happened around the same time that it was circulating homes. And now the common belief is that their souls are trapped inside this painting by an evil spirit. And now another beautiful lady portrait, Marie Laveau. And her side eye is a lot more intense. It went from sultry, I have a secret smolder to auntie ready to catch you doing something you shouldn't. This image is carefully on display at the New Orleans Historic Voodoo Museum where some people say that they can feel Marie's cold eyes watching them and others say that once you see this image, the Marie will haunt you and even show up in your nightmares. As cheesy as that may sound, the tour guides do say that whoever wishes to see the painting must go alone as they refuse to go see it themselves. And in my opinion, it's pretty prominent and safe to say that there's something to believe if the staff is uncomfortable. Think about it, they're there every day. If they say something's up, I'm gonna believe them. Some visitors have even claimed that when they take a picture of the painting, their photos won't develop. Maybe that's fair though, if you sat that long for a painting, you don't really want somebody to just snap a two second picture of it and just go. So, and now for yet another lady portrait. It's mostly those. And this one is Henrietta Nelson. And I hate it. I just do not like it. Nothing about it is good or right. It's all pale and washed out. And not to get some mojo put on me, but she's looking a little 
little dumpy. Little like a wet, soggy potato. Pruny from water, finger energy, if one could say. It was painted by William Johnson in 1780. And when Nelson, depicted in the painting, died in 1816, she was buried in a mausoleum at her home rather than the family tomb per her wishes. When her estate was sold, the new owners demolished the mausoleum and moved Nelson's remains to a church. According to legend, that is when Nelson's spirit began to roam. Some claim her expression in the portrait changed at times, or that they saw an apparition of her wearing the same clothing as in the painting. Brian Hall, the longtime owner, claimed that Banningham Rectory felt empty after the painting was stolen one night, as if her spirit had gone with it. The portrait of Henrietta was finally returned to its rightful home after seven years. It's now once again in circulation though, as Brian Hall eventually sold all of his haunted artifacts at the age of 82 due to his ill health. Let's get reflective. The Rokeby Venus. This gothic masterpiece is riddled with drama and poetry. As an art lover, I can say I'm a big fan of this piece. Nudes were banned by the Spanish Inquisition at the time that Diego chose to paint this masterpiece, so it's a mystery to us why he chose to risk his reputation, his class, career, and dare say even his life on painting this. It's said that this is one of the only Venus paintings where it's Venus in the mirror as the concept to not see her face in the reflection clearly or accurately, feeding into curse ideology with its abnormality. The first mention of the curse happens with the 13th century Duchess of Alba, Marie de Silva, who's believed to have taken her own life due to looking at the painting every day and being reminded of beauty aging away. The next owner was part of Napoleon's army, whose vanity and ego caused him to desert and disappoint his peoples, and he left the painting when he abandoned his country. Any owners of this piece have always mysteriously become sick or were outright killed. The painting is purchased by the king eventually and put in display at the Art Gallery of London, where its vandalism resurged the ideology of a curse. No museum in history has been able to hold on to this piece as workers and visitors become unhinged and even attempt to destroy the display. At one time, a female visitor managed to slice the painting seven times with a knife. Next is the Soul Bowl, which is so fun to say, love that energy. So this painting made waves online when it was posted on a website called Trade Me, the user listing it as haunted and wanting it gone ASAP. Having been bought in an antique shop in New Zealand, the artist is unknown. As you can see, it's got an abstract red background with a frankly dinky ass bowl painted kind of centerfold. Along the sides of the canvas, the artist had written, the shape of my soul is a bowl. This looks like someone's DIY in my opinion, or maybe like a wine and paint night your mom and her friends went to do. I'm not really pissing myself over it, but apparently after they brought this painting home, scary things did start to happen. She claims that some nights the painting would fall off the wall. She also claims that another night she saw a dark silhouette go from her bedroom to the painting and after numerous other paranormal encounters, she decided to sell it. Number five. ASOG, not to be confused with ASA, not the same at all. My autocorrect was not, I'm like, no, that's not the one. ASOG is a demon from Sumerian mythology who is associated with disease and destruction. The two Ds you don't want right there. Not D&D, the fun ones, the D&D, the bad ones. According to legend, he was born from the god Anu and the goddess Ki, but was rejected by both of them, yikes, because of his monstrous appearance. That's sad, that's pretty sad. They both rejected him because of his looks. Like, guy, you made this. What are you talking about his looks? That's half you. ASOG is depicted as a large horned creature with a scaly body and sharp claws, said to bring chaos and fear wherever he goes. Yeah, definitely. Asog is often associated with the spread of illness and pestilence. Now, Sumerian mythology really did not like this one. Some versions of the myth would have Asog be defeated by the god Ninurta, who uses the power of the storm to vanquish the demon and, you know, restore order to the world which, yay. So unless you have a storm lying around anywhere, it's gonna be a tough fight. You're probably gonna lose this one. Number four, Floros. Floros is a fun one. As far as appearances go, he's a little different. Not so much a dragon this time around, so that's great. Floros was said to have the power to cause destruction and chaos. Now, according to some accounts, he would appear as a leopard or as a man with the wings of a griffin. <laughs> Two very different descriptions, but I'll take it. I like the cheetah version a bit more. He looks so vulnerable that way. He looks like he's like naked, like he forgot a towel after he showered. I don't know. As far as demons go, not as intimidating. But as far as powers go, he packs a punch. Fluoros is associated with fire and is said to have the ability to control or summon it, just like that. How fun. Yeah, flame on, I guess. I'm never sleeping again. Fluoros is also known for his ability to reveal hidden secrets and to protect those 
who summon him. So if your homies with him, you're good. Otherwise, fire and silly walks are coming your way. It's said he should only be summoned by experienced practitioners of the occult. So no amateurs allowed. Just people that are OG with the occult and you're good. Number three, Incubi and Succubi. Two for the price of one. Let's go, why not? Incubi and Succubi, these supernatural creatures are from various cultural and religious traditions, so. You know, pick your poison. They're often described as demons that prey on humans during sleep, so yeah, say goodbye to your eight hours. Incubi, they're male demons who visit women in their dreams, often for sexual purposes, yikes. While succubi, they're female demons who visit men in their dreams. They're the, they're the Bonnie and Clyde of confusing dreams, I guess. In some traditions, they're believed to have been the offspring of fallen angels and mortal women. The legends of incubi and succubi have actually been used to explain sleep paralysis, so I hope that didn't just ruin your day. His and her demons, how cute. Number two, Baphomet. Baphomet is a deity that originated in medieval European occultism and has since been associated with various mystical practices, as are all of these. They're just used many a times in many a places. Baphomet is typically depicted as, well, you'd guess, the classic winged humanoid, disgusting looking figure with a goat's head and scary horns. But here's where Baphomet, dare I say, here's where they stand out. They're often seated on a throne with an inverted pentagram symbol. Yeah, this guy sounds a bit familiar, doesn't he? Baphomet has been associated with various occult concepts such as the union of opposites and the pursuit of spiritual enlightenment, which is, I mean, don't Google those, that's for sure. In modern times, Baphomet has been adopted by various groups and movements, including that of Satanism and the occult. This is our OG Satan right here. That's him, I guess. I say our, like I'm part of the cult. I don't know, that was weird. The earliest reference to Baphomet is a letter written by French Crusader back in 1098. So yeah, keep an eye out if you see a demon humanoid on the Iron Throne. I guess watch out for that guy, sure. And finally, number one, Leviathar. The best for last, in my opinion. The goddess of death and pain, according to Finnish mythology. We'll finish with the Finnish. There we go. She's also known as the Lady of the North, which sounds like a character from Game of Thrones, but she was a little more haunting than the naked red witch was. Yeah, a little different looking, that's for sure. And she's believed to be the daughter of the god of the underworld, so daddy issues for sure, probably. Leviathar is described as a tall woman with pale complexion, dressed in all black clothing, and she's associated with disease, plague, suffering, pain, illness, all that good stuff, and is said to have given birth to nine diseases. Nine. Not two, not three, just nine diseases. Couldn't get enough of them, just here. Take them all, why not? Leviathar was feared and respected by the ancient Finns, and offerings were made to her in times of illness or calamity. Her influence can still be seen in modern Finnish culture and folklore. Again, creating nine diseases, yeah, we're probably gonna talk about her for a few years. Like, don't, don't do that maybe. One, fine, maybe one to build character, but nine diseases? Too much. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters. Hit that subscribe, hit that like down below. Talk about Ouija boards. Do you have any of those? How, how's, how's it going with those? Any, any curses, any demons? Anyone on the ceiling yet? I might get a Ouija board, I don't know. Starting off with S for secrets. Alrighty, so here is from the Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago, specifically the one from 1978. On the left there, all washed out and crappy old flash display style is First Lady Rosalind Carter. The guy shaking her hand, or rather just holding it and staring off camera like a waiter just went by with a tray of warm sausage rolls he wants to really get into, is John Wayne Gacy. And if you're also thinking, yo, what is up with this guy being in so many random famous photos. You're absolutely right, and it's genuinely strange how photographed and out there Gacy was. By the time this was taken, he had already killed over 20 people. Also, when he wasn't side hustling as a clown, he was super active in the government and politics, thus why wearing the S on the lapel. It was given to him by the Secret Service to indicate special security clearance. So the S literally does stand for secrets, both the US government and his own. Whose secrets are worse though, huh? Huh? Anyways, at the bottom of the handshake photo, you can see the handwritten address to John Gacy. Best wishes, Rosalind Carter. I've heard beauty is pain, but I haven't heard beauty is the next Saw movie. Check out the beauty calibrator. Seeing pictures, you may think it's some sort of Middle Ages torture machine, or as said, literally one of those Saw movie head devices. But surprisingly not, it's another way to point out women's insecurities and find the smallest things possible to make them feel bad over. Meet the Max Factor beauty calibration machine. It is the only one in existence thank God, and in 1932, the makeup legend Max Factor came up with this ingenious invention combining fearonology, cosmetics, and insecurity gaslighting with pseudoscience analysis of a woman's physical flaws. Max Factor's beauty calibrator enabled Hollywood makeup artists to pinpoint where facial corrections needed to be made down to a literal fraction. The machine, also known in the trades as the beauty micrometer, revealed that a natural perfect face was a myth. Every single woman was imperfect and needed correction, and this machine could find 
find it by taking precise measures. It would mark spots that needed to be fixed, and then the artist, once the helmet was removed, could correct all the new insecurities with makeup that you didn't have before you put the stupid thing on. Next up is a photo that's all dramatic flair, the death card. Masseria represented an outdated mindset in the mafia world, one that could no longer be reasoned with diplomatically. The same is true of his rival, Maranzano. The ongoing tit-for-tat killing between the two genuinely wreaked havoc on not only the streets, but in the mafia hierarchy itself. Those resistant to change generally don't last long, and meetings of the mafia elite tried to bring around at the end of bloodshed, but Maranzano especially consistently manipulated matters to his own advantage. In order to facilitate underworld peace, the consensus turned from diplomacy to the inevitable. One of these guys had to go. The final straw, according to the account of Nicola Gentile, was when the police informants called Messiria and said knock off the violence. Having an idealism for peace, he actually responded by disarming his men, and they were all pissed. Joe the boss, Messiria, his bodyguards, and Lucky Luciano all met at a seafood restaurant at 3 p.m. on April 15th of 1931. Luciano excuses himself from the card game while that they're playing to visit the bathroom. This is the signal for the hitmen. The bangs could be heard from around the block, apparently, as Joe was hit from behind four times in the back and one in the head. And it's born, the infamous Ace of Spades shot. It added to the cult status of this hit, but many expect that the Ace of Spades card was placed between Mysterious fingers after the hit by a photographer just for the shock factor of the press. Next is a series of photos recovered before they could be lost. Holes in a window. Former LAPD reserve officer turned photographer Merrick Morton was faffing around in the LA police department when he comes across a stash of LAPD crime photos ranging in the dates of 1920s all the way to the 1970s. These were cellulose nitrate based film and the negatives were so decomposed they're deemed fire hazard. But Merrick saw enough of the few stills to know that they'd be an absolute effing gold mine. Working with Phototech and Photo Digitation Service and the US National Film Archive, the photos were given a new life. This collection is NSFW and there are hundreds. Now spruced up, the macabre photos are mostly crimes and many of them violent and depicting the bodies or surviving victims' injuries. Obviously, the ones you're seeing on screen as I'm talking are tamer, such as my choice, the one you're seeing now, holes in the car window. Something about it gives me a deep sense of discomfort, thus the choice. The collection contains recognizable crimes and faces too, an unusual photo of Malaya Nurmi dressed as Vampira, pictures of comedian Lenny Bruce's OD in March of 1966, and images of the Manson family arriving at their arrangement in 1970. Every photo is scary and every single has a disturbing backstory. Some captions are provided by author James Elroy in his book LAPD 53. You can win, but sometimes you still lose in the end. It's the devastated Disney's. Meet Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. There are some everyday photos of these two in their prime. Who were they? In case you couldn't tell by all the Disney crap in the background of said photos, they played somewhat of a big role. You know, writing the lyrics and music for Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast, as well as a few others. Also, not to mention creating The Little Shop of Horrors, which got them hired by Disney in the first place. And in this photo you see now, they had just won the Oscars for The Little Mermaid. Hooray! But why does Ashman look so unhappy? This was his life's accomplishments. It's because that night Ashman told Menken they needed to have a serious talk when they got back to New York. And when they get back a few days later, Ashman admits that he has HIV that's quickly progressed and he's going to die soon and fast. They had been songwriting partners for over a decade and were in the middle of working on Beauty and the Beast. And despite the illness, Ashman completed the lyrical work and the initial work on Aladdin. On the morning of March 14, 1991, he does die from heart failure caused by his condition. At the time of his death, he only weighed 80 pounds, he'd lost his sight and could barely speak, and a voice that spoke so eloquently through song was lost forever. Before he passed, however, Disney production scrambled to finish the film so he could see a screening of it. The film earned Ashman and Menken three 1991 Academy Award nominations for Best Song and the title song winning the award. Perhaps most amazingly, Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award for Best Motion Picture. So it looks like a photo of two men achieving their wildest dreams, but it's a record of their last known moment together. Number 5. House Arrest Classic story, really. Medieval times is also defined by kings and queens and emperors and leaders handing down their dynasties to male-born heirs. Has to be male, those are the rules, I don't make them up. And sometimes people attempt their best to, well, steal the throne or the crown from underneath their fathers, mothers, uncles, or, or really anyone who's got power and anyone who doesn't. It's, it's kind of how it goes, a vicious cycle. Well, as successful as Shah Jahan was, even his own blood was out for him. His own son, I'm gonna try and pronounce this, Ar Arganzeb, Arganzeb, Organzeb. His own son, Organzeb. That's a hell of a name, it sounds like a super villain. 
His own son, Organzeb, put him and his sister under house arrest, doing his best to solidify his place in the throne. When it was all said and done, Shah Jahan had passed away, but sadly, due to his political strife and some family drama that is straight out of all my children, he was not given proper burial rites, which then was a big slap in the face. That sucks, dude. That sucks. You rule country, you're nice to everybody, and then your frickin' son just comes in and stabs you in the back. Number four, Footloose. Remember Footloose, 80s classic movie, right? It's a good movie, it's a feel good movie. We have some decent music too. The plot is a little rough to say the least. I mean, what town would outlaw dancing? I mean, who in their right mind would ever do that? Well, meet King Argonzeb, who banned poetry, music, dancing, and even some writings. May as well just throw Kevin Bacon and dancing in there while you're at it. As a small town, I'd be more worried about what those teenagers are doing after the dance party, not the actual dancing. Argonzeb's concerns were that of religious reform, as in classic medieval times like previously mentioned. Well, as you can guess, this didn't go very well as the Empire was already a well-established place of mixed religion and arts and all the other beautiful culture stuff. Taking that away wasn't going to make the people happy, and it didn't. He struggled to maintain power of a successful empire like his father did. Ew, rough. It's, it's, you know, if you, if you take over and it gets better, fine, but if it's worse, eh, kind of awkward. Number three, the Red Fort. As it turns out, the same architect who built the Taj Mahal also built many other Mughal Empire buildings like the Red Fort. You do good work, you get more work. As simple as that. It's the life of an actor. The Red Fort originally, white and red, hence the name, was the main residence of Mughal emperors after the capital moved from Agra to Delhi. At one point, even held the throne that was encrusted with the crown jewel of the Mughal Empire. It's so where did business happen? It was an important building for the empire and culture that still stands today. On Indian Independence Day today, the Prime Minister raises the flag from the fort and addresses the nation. Number two, Humanyun's tomb. Okay, so we all know the Taj Mahal was built for a wife who had passed away by a grieving husband. Well, Humanyun's tomb was built for a husband who had passed away by a grieving wife. The first garden tomb ever constructed, and honestly, when the editor pulls a picture up of this bad boy, it's pretty cool. Considering how old these buildings are, it's impressive it's still standing. Oh, and when I said wife, I actually meant mistress. It was, it was a mistress, uh, built by the side chick, if you will. I wonder how the wife felt. Better not bring that up. If side is building a palace, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the wifey doing? Well, you know what I'm saying? Jeez. Number one, British imports. Yes, the whole reason Britain tore down an empire and stole some tea and maybe some artifacts. I don't know, I, I, I haven't heard. Or rather had some solid importation of tea coming in every month. Whether or not these farmhands were paid, well, eh, you get the point, you know where I'm going with that. However, more interesting, and I thought I had to bring this up, because it's just so cool, was textiles. It sounds lame, but it's really cool actually. Textiles, cloth, silk, dyes, you name it. Europe did a lot of trade with the Mughals, but Britain, of course, Britain wanted a cap on the market as 95% of their textile goods actually came from the Mughal Empire. So it just made sense to own the whole thing. If you already got 95%, maybe just take the whole thing, just take it, it's yours. Starting our list off at number 10, Lake Neos. We love talking about Pompeii, we can't get enough of it. I'm fascinated. They have a restaurant that's back and open now in Pompeii, it's crazy. Now that's quite the eruption, historically, that's a bad one, that's pretty scary. But a recent eruption in 1986, well we don't talk about this one enough. First of all, a limnic eruption is a rare event, so you can sleep not in fear tonight. It occurs when CO2 dissolved in deep water lakes suddenly erupts. Cause uh, yeah, that can happen, who knew that? That's why I don't like lakes. There you go, right there. These events have only been observed twice, the deadliest being Lake Neos in 1986. When a limnic eruption occurs, large clouds of CO2 form, which then all of a sudden descend and drop below the oxygen in the air, causing all living things in the vicinity to choke and not survive anymore. In this case, the cloud fell on nearby villages, ultimately causing the deaths of 1,700 people and 3,500 livestock. Number nine, the Spanish flu of 1918. The Spanish flu of 1918. Okay, yeah, this one's probably pretty good. Since we know a little something about plagues now in real life and toilet paper and stress, let's turn the clocks back 95 years when the Spanish flu entered the game. What was it like back then? The Spanish flu, if you didn't know, it was a strain of the H1N1 virus, which we all know as well. And when it hit, it took 50 to 100 million people. 
very fast. 4% of the world's population gone. Now, it was recent and it was quite horrible. We couldn't stay home and watch Ozark for that one, so instead, the Spanish flu is said to have spread so violently because of soldiers being in close quarters during World War I. Yeah, again, very different than our plague. Immune systems were shot as is, and you're telling me a plague rolled through while we're in trenches? No way, what a nightmare. But just like that, the virus disappeared. Better treatment, perhaps it mutated into a much weaker strain. Either way, great, stay gone. Get out of here, go away and stay there, pal. Hit that thumbs up for the Spanish flu not being around. Awesome, we love that. It's a good one to not have. Number eight, the great dying. This name's pretty accurate, if I'm being honest myself. Scariest environment imaginable. Here we go. Turning the clocks and solar system back 252 million years ago, the Permian Triassic extinction, which for convenience sake we'll call the great dying, was and hopefully shall remain the largest extinction event on earth. The fact that we're even alive right now, watching this video, clicking that thumbs up and subscribing, well, it's all pretty rare, all things considered. This was a butterfly effect triggered by a massive massive volcanic eruption around the Serbian traps in Russia. A runaway greenhouse effect was responsible for the loss of 95% of all marine life and 70% of all land animals. That's so everything, pretty much. Pretty much everything's gone. Temperatures rose as the sea began to absorb large quantities of CO2 from the atmosphere. Mentioned that a little earlier, and that could not be great. And it began turning into carbonic acid, hence all that marine life that didn't make it. Methane hydrate then started to bubble from the ocean surface surface, which is horrifying to imagine, and it raised the temperature even higher at that point. Now, imagine if this didn't happen. We'd have those scary sharks still swimming around. We're remnants of the surviving 4% of the great dying. Yeah, tell all your friends that. I'm gonna add that to my LinkedIn. That sounds not half bad. Yeah, I survived the great dying, so yeah. Really good at scooping ice cream. Let's do it. Number seven, Maximilien Robespierre. On July 27th, 1794, French revolutionary Maximilien Robespierre and 21 of his followers were all arrested at the Hotel de Ville in Paris. Now, considering that this was 1794 and we got arrested, what follows is sure to be a public nightmare. The next day, Robespierre and again, 21 of his followers were all taken to the Palace de Revolution where they were all executed by guillotine before a cheering crowd. Always a cheering crowd, of course. What, are, what else are we doing today? Let's go watch. What history tends to leave out of this part is that Maximilian tempted to take his own life beforehand because he knew his fate was gonna suck with the whole you know, thing. But when he tried to take his own life, he survived and was left instead with a nasty jaw wound. So in Game of Thrones fashion, the executioner, when the time came, ripped the jaw bandage off first and then he saw the guillotine. Yeah, again, to a cheering crowd, remember? They all watch this, all this unfold. I can't even watch UFC sometimes. You're telling me people watch this? IRL? That's, I'm gonna go throw up real quick. Be right back. Number six. The eruption. Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines, was another volcanic eruption that shook up history. A little more recent than the other one. This was on June 15th, 1991. Mount Pinatubo, this massive volcano, erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Impressive? Yes. Terrifying? Absolutely. Yep, this is very loud and scary. Activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd, 1991. And these things take a little time to, you know, finish up. So that same year, researchers set up seismographs in the area, and by June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions. And then on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent hot ash 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere, which then rained on down to everything around it, which is the worst thing I can imagine. Additional smaller eruptions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. And then then, on June 15th, the volcano once again went off, this time sending a cloud of ash 40 kilometers into the atmosphere. So, bye bye sun for a little bit. This one's gonna linger, won't it? Number five, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program launched in 1946 to 1947, an operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1946. 1947, or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, 
Bird and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three month operation. Seems like the public thinks that High Jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the Earth type stuff. Yep. Apparently, there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic, and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up. It's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board, the title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop, the first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers 0 through 9. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included, nor needed. Now, the origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by, good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no-brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia Experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the U.S. Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer, the USS Eldridge, and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. Terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a U.S. Navy research organization. The U.S. Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the Big Ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues astonished. The wow signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Amon discovered the anomaly, impressed by the result. On the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow. Leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds, and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protus-class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where 
magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Pope Gregory IX. Pope Gregory IX was the Bishop of Rome and the ruler of the Papal States from 1227 until his passing in 1241. The Papal States were a series of territories in the Italian peninsula that were under direct rule of the Pope from the 8th century all the way to 1870. It turns out that Pope Gregory IX had a very strange hatred for cats. He said that black cats were actually the instruments of Satan, which seems a little extreme, but then he actually went as far as to order that they be exterminated throughout Europe, which is definitely a little extreme. With this order, the Pope's followers had to oblige, and there was a drastic reduction in the cat population. But of course, this caused a disturbance to the ecosystem, and the time and the consequence of that became very evident. Because of the decline of cats, there was a sudden increase in the amount of rats, most of which may have been carrying the plague. There are a lot of historians who would argue that this war on cats may have had a huge effect on the severity of the Black Plague. That is, of course, speculation as it's pretty difficult to pinpoint who could be at fault for something like that, but it certainly is a very interesting point. This all really does, however, bring me to my next point. In our number 9 spot today, we have the Black Death. I'm sure we've all heard of the Black Death at some point or another. I mean, how could we possibly ever stop talking about something like that? During the 1340s, there was an outbreak of the bubonic plague that spread rapidly throughout Europe and Asia. It was called the Black Plague because of the fact that this illness would cause people's lymph nodes to become swollen and black. The Black Death was absolutely terrible and it caused a lot of agony for those who had to go through it. Symptoms included things like severe body aches, fever, vomiting, and eventual death in most cases. There was no cure for the plague, so it just continued to spread. In the end, the Black Death took the lives of hundreds of millions of people. We now all know for firsthand what it is like to live through a pandemic, and I certainly wouldn't sign up to do it again anytime soon, so I'm most definitely sure the times of the Black Death were some of the worst times in history. Apparently it is said that if you lived in the 1340s, there was basically a 50-50 chance that you'd survive the Black Death. And then on top of that, there's all of the other horrifying ways to die that the medieval times held. All in all, I'm kind of shocked that we're still here today. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Mongol invasion. Being in China during the Mongol invasion certainly was a terrible terrifying time. I'm sure a lot of us here have heard at least some of the stories surrounding Genghis Khan, but if you haven't, let's just say that being on his bad side certainly wasn't a good thing for you. In 1205, when the Mongol invasion in China began, it was the regular citizens of China who paid the ultimate price. What was started by Genghis Khan was carried on by his son and then his grandson, which ultimately led to a 74 year long campaign that was filled with brutality and destruction. Cities and towns were destroyed, empires were brought down and millions of completely innocent people lost their lives. It is believed that this invasion took the lives of enough people to cut the population in half from 120 million before to just 60 million after. Anyone living in China at this time would have had to live in absolute fear of being killed for something that you really had nothing to do with. That would be awful and absolutely terrifying. In our number 7 spot today we have Pope Formosus and Pope Stephen VI. Pope Formosus was the ruler of the papal states from October 6th, 891, until he passed away on April 4th, 896. After his passing, Pope Boniface VI took his place as ruler for just a few weeks before he also passed away, which then left Pope Stephen VI as the ruler from then on until his death. After this whirlwind April of 1896, things got even weirder. Before his passing, Pope Formosus had sided with Arnulf of Carinthia against Lambert of Spoleto, which was definitely not okay with Pope Stephen VI. So once Pope Stephen VI gets to the place of being the ruler, he gets the people to exhume the body of Pope Formosus so that he can put him on trial. I feel like this is very gross and very unnecessary, but this really is the type of stuff that went on in the 800s. They propped the body up for trial and had a deacon answer questions for him since he obviously was unable to do that himself. They ended up finding the corpse guilty, which seems a little unfair, and they actually 
actually went as far as to strip the body of its sacred vestments, took three fingers from the right hand as they were the blessing fingers, they dressed the body in regular people clothes instead of the clothing a pope would be buried in, and then they reburied the body. If this poor man's body hadn't been through enough, it was later re-exhumed again and thrown into the river. If this story wasn't already wild enough, this whole debacle is actually what would later end up getting Pope Stephen imprisoned and then killed, alright? So I guess the other pope had his justice in the end, I don't know man. In our number 6 spot today we have King Charles VI. King Charles VI started off his reign by being very well loved and respected, but as time went on over his 4 decades of ruling, he ended up being known as Charles the Mad. His erratic behavior had him hacking up Nights, imagining that he was Saint George, and he would also have bouts of amnesia where he would be able to recognize some people, but not his wife and children. This is all very strange and of course quite sad as he was obviously exhibiting signs of extreme mental illness, but one of the strangest symptoms was him believing that he was made of glass. He was terribly frightened of falling or being jostled too hard, and he would actually insert iron rods into his clothing to try and keep himself from shattering. But then he would also apparently run wild at top speeds throughout the halls of the castle or the streets, which would obviously mean that he was completely abandoning his fear of fragility. It apparently got so bad that he had to be held inside with the entrances blocked off. Sadly, he continued on this path until he passed away in 1422. Number 5. The Perrin Family in 1952, Ed and Lorraine founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. They quickly gained notoriety after this next case. The Perrins. In 1971, the Perrin family, Carolyn, Roger, and their five daughters moved into a 14-room farmhouse in Rhode Island. At first, items started disappearing, then the ghostly sightings started. It was discovered that the home had some previous sinister owners. Self-emulation, freak accidents, and of course, murder in the attic. Whoever the spirit was, she perceived herself to be the mistress of the house, and she resented the competition my mother posed. The parents asked the Warrens to come in more than 10 separate times to help against this sinister ghastly entity. During one seance, Carolyn was possessed, even rising from the ground while sitting in a chair. Andrea, the oldest daughter, said, My mother began to speak a language not of this world in a voice not of her own. Then her chair levitated and she was thrown across the room. Yeah, just zipping around the house, floating around on a chair like the Jetsons? Yeah, no thank you, that's like haunted haunted. Just bulldoze that thing, would you? Number four, the ring. One ring to rule them all. The vine ring, aka the ring of Silvianus, is a gold ring from the fourth century AD. The ring was discovered on a farm in 1785 in England. First the property of a British Roman named Silvianus. Apparently it was stolen by a person named Senecianus, upon which Silvianus hexed the ring with a curse. In 1929, during excavations of the site, archaeologists discovered the now curse that goes with said ring, consulting shortly after with one J.R.R. Tolkien. Mm. The band of the ring has ten edges. Among it is the goddess Venus engraved, along with the words, live in God. The lore goes, Silvianus's ring was stolen by someone named Senecianus. Silvianus created and hexed a tablet, which he wrote, for the god Nodens. Silvianus has lost a ring that has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named Senecianus, permit no good health until it's returned to the temple of Nodens. Yeah, that sounds like a spell to me, dude. And Noden is like Poseidon, so you don't want any of that smoke. Number three, a haunting in Connecticut. Based on all real case end point, a 2009 gem, the accounts of the horrific case of the Snedekers who moved into a ghost infested house in Connecticut, unknowingly moving in to one of the most sinister haunted funeral homes on earth. At first, mom notices items missing, but that's just the start. Then the children started to see strange people in their home, and then their son started to act a little strange. Violent outbursts, physical attacks on his own family. Maybe he was becoming the next victim to the house's grim history. After months of scary stuff going on, the Warrens were finally called in and turned out the morticians that had lived there previously had practiced some abysmally sinister acts on some lifeless bodies, deepening the home into the hell it was now sold as. An exorcism or two later, and the house finally became a home again. The case can be reimagined in 2009's Haunting in Connecticut, where the story follows the story drawn out by the Snedekers all those sinister years ago. Yo, Taylor gets possessed, I'm swinging immediately. You know what I mean? Like so many holy hands right away, just. Number two. 
Number two, Statue of Lem. The Women of Lem statue was discovered in Lem, Cyprus in 1878 and dates back to about 3500 BCE. The statue earned the nickname the Goddess of Death after four different families experienced tragedy while possessing the carved stones. The first owner, along with his entire family, died within six years of owning the statue, all of mysterious and rapid illnesses. The other two owners also died, of course, along with their entire families, just a few short years after obtaining the statue. The fourth owner died alongside his wife and two daughters of mysterious causes while in possession of the rock. Now, a gift to the Royal Scottish Museum in Edinburgh. It's encased in glass, safe, and unable to bear any other family bad omens. And number one, the mummy. My number one spot, of course, this is the most terrifying find of all. In 1991, a 5,000 year old frozen preserved human mummy was discovered in the frozen Otzel Apse of Italy. Otzi, of course, is the name the researchers chose to name this mummy for obvious location reasons. Otzi, though, is believed to have been murdered before being frozen in time due to the discovery of an arrowhead embedded in his left shoulder, various wounds on his body, and also the blood soaked tunic he's wearing with multiple people's DNA on it. Maybe in combat, maybe from megafauna. Who knows? Scientists believe that he's the oldest known naturally preserved mummy on Earth. This is where it's gonna get spooky. Once unearthed, a curse surfaced too, and grew stronger as people linked to him began to die one after another in violent freak accidents. So far, seven deaths have been tied or related to Otzi's dethawing, including forensic pathologist who was killed in a car accident en route to give a speech about Otzi, a mountaineer in an avalanche, a hiker who discovered the Iceman falling down a treacherous path, the molecular archaeologist was found dead in his home, the head of the forensic team had a heart attack, another discoverer died of a sudden brain tumor, and another of multiple sclerosis. Yo, say what you will about curses, when people start dropping all involved with the find, I'd say it's probably the 5,000 year old mummy you just found. You think? Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Luis Garavito. Luis gained a nickname from the media of The Beast, and I think that's a great indication of the nature of his atrocious crimes. He is said to be one of the worst serial killers in the entire world, and it is believed that his victim count is up in the 300s range, which is absolutely shocking. He confessed to 147 crimes, and he was found guilty on 139 of those counts, which put his sentence at 1,000. 1853 years. But here's the thing this trial took place in Colombia, where he lives, and there is a law, or was a law, which puts the maximum sentence to 30 years. He was sentenced in 1999, meaning there's really only a few years left of this sentence. He also had years taken off of his sentence because he assisted police in the search to recover some of the victim's bodies, which means that just this year, in 2023, he is eligible for parole. Okay, that's great. According to Luis himself, he committed these crimes because he had made a deal with the devil, and he explained that satanic ritual was involved in all of his crimes. In our number nine spot today, we have William Bonin. This horrible person is said to be responsible for taking the lives of 21 young men in Southern California from May of 1979 to June of 1980. It is said that on at least 12 of these occasions, he was assisted by one of his four known accomplices, and it is even speculated that he might be responsible for 15 more of these crimes that evidence hasn't officially been able to connect him to. He was often referred to as the freeway killer because of the fact that most of the bodies were found along the freeway of Southern California. The police surveilled William until they could catch him in the act, which they did. In the beginning, he claimed innocence, but after receiving an impassioned letter from one of the victim's mothers, which asked him to please share the location of her son's body, he confessed his guilt. But he made sure to clarify that it wasn't so the mother could be at peace and her pain could be eased. No, of course not. Instead, he said, quote, I was dying for a hamburger and I knew if I went out with the cops, they would get me a hamburger. Right, just gonna take a moment and let that sink in. At his first trial, the prosecutor described him as, quote, the most arch evil person who ever existed. William was convicted on 14 of his crimes and was sentenced to death. He spent 14 years on death row before his sentence was carried out in 1996. In our number 8 spot today, we have Robert Hansen. Robert is often referred to as the Butcher Baker, and his story truly is horrific. He is one of the most prolific serial killers in Alaska's history, because for over a decade he would kidnap women and bring them into the wilderness, where he would then stalk them like prey. 
The reason he got away with his crimes for so long is because outside of these horrifying crimes, he was just a soft-spoken baker. Robert was heading to church by day and prowling the streets by night. What led to the downfall of this horrible monster was a badass named Cindy Paulson, who was able to escape from Robert and was sure to leave evidence behind. She then went to authorities and told them what happened, and this led to a search warrant for Robert's property, which is where all the evidence they needed lied. Robert is believed to have taken the lives of at least 17 women, and in 1983 he was sentenced to 461 years and a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In our number 7 spot today we have Vicki Dawn Jackson. Vicki was a woman who worked as a nurse for a number of years. She first got her nursing license in 1989, but it wasn't until the 2000s when things took a seriously dark turn. Between December of 2000 and February of 2001, the hospital that Vicki was working for recorded a number of deaths that was was unusual, it was a much higher amount. Most of these patients were in the age range of 60 to 100 years old. Of course, people just chalked this up to the advanced age of most of these patients, but a rumor began to spread that someone might actually be responsible. After this, the hospital's administrator noticed that a vial of a drug called Mevacron had gone missing. You might see where I'm going with this. As it turns out, the person responsible was Nurse Vicky, and she had at least 10 patients whose lives she took by giving them too much of this missing it was a muscle relaxant. Take in that this is 10 people between December and February. That is an unbelievable amount of people in a remarkably short amount of time. You might be wondering why she took these lives, and apparently she did it when she found those people rude or quote, too demanding. Okay, Vicky, get a different job then. I don't know. In our number six spot today, we have Michael Bear Carson and Susan Carson. This couple is not one that anyone would want to encounter. The stories of these two come from the 80s. They were married, and on the outside, they appeared just like a happy couple of harmless hippies. We all know, though, not to judge a book by its cover. In the end, they would go on to become known as the San Francisco Witch Killers. Didn't know San Francisco held so many witches. Basically, together, the pair took the lives of three separate people between 1981 and 1983. They started off by killing their roommate, who Susan claimed was a witch, and said that she was stealing her quote, health, power, and beauty. They next killed one guy that they worked with on a farm because they said that he was a demon. The final person they took the life of unfortunately picked up the pair as they were hitchhiking, and they took his life because they claimed he was a quote, black witch, whatever that means. Essentially, they were just committing crimes against people that they claimed to be witches. The pair were each tried and convicted for each separate crime and are both serving sentences of 75 years to life. Neither of them have ever shown any kind of remorse for what they've done. In our number 5 spot today, we have the London Burkers. This is the name used to refer to a notorious gang of body snatchers who operated in London in the early 19th century. They were involved in the illegal trade of selling corpses to medical schools for dissection and study, and they would often resort to killings to obtain the bodies. The most infamous member of the gang was William Burke, who, along with his partner William Hare, committed a series of killings in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1828. They sold the corpses to the anatomist Robert Knox, who was unaware of their methods. Two of the group's members, John Bishop and Thomas Williams, were convicted of killings and sentenced to death. The London Burker scandal highlighted the demand for fresh corpses for medical research and contributed to the passage of the Anatomy Act of 1832, which allowed for the legal procurement of corpses for medical purposes. Emphasis on the legal part of that, though. It's important. In our number four spot today, we have the Great Stink of London. The Great Stink of London was an environmental disaster that occurred in the summer of 1858. It was caused by the city's inadequate sewage system, which allowed raw sewage and waste to be dumped directly into the River Thames. The hot weather only exacerbated the problem, which is disgusting, and it caused the sewage to ferment and emit a foul odor that permeated the city. The smell was so overwhelming that it caused widespread illness and forced many people to flee the city. Parliament was forced to act, and a major engineering project was launched to build a modern sewage system for London. This project was led by engineer Joseph Bazalget, who designed a system of sewers and pumping stations that would carry sewage out of the city and into the Thames estuary. The construction of the new sewage system was a massive undertaking, involving the excavation of miles of tunnels and the construction of large pumping stations. It took several years to complete, but once it was finished, it greatly improved the health and hygiene of the city. The Great 
stink was a turning point in the history of public health, and it helped to spur major improvements in sanitation and public health infrastructure across the developed world. Today, the legacy of the Great Stink lives on in the modern sewer systems and wastewater treatment facilities that are really essential for maintaining public health and environmental quality. In our number three spot today, we have Typhoid Mary. The Typhoid Mary case is a famous incident in the history of public health in the United States. Mary Mallon, also known as Typhoid Mary, was an asymptomatic carrier of the bacteria that causes typhoid fever, a potentially fatal disease. Despite being unaware of her condition, Mary inadvertently infected numerous people during her work as a cook in New York City in the early 1900s. After a number of typhoid outbreaks were traced back to Mary's cooking, she was tracked down and forcibly quarantined for several years. The case generated significant controversy at the time, with some arguing that Mary's civil rights had been violated and others maintaining that public safety justified her isolation. The Typhoid Mary case remains significant for its implications for public health policy and for the balance between individual rights and public safety. In our number two spot today, we have the Birmingham riots. These riots took place in 1839, and they were a series of violent clashes that occurred in the city of Birmingham, England. The riots were sparked by tensions between two groups, the Chartists, who were calling for political reform and greater democratic representation, and the authorities who opposed the movement. On July 4th, 1839, a group of Chartists held a rally in Birmingham's Bull Ring, where they were met with opposition from local government agencies. The situation quickly escalated into violence, with protesters and authorities engaging in brutal clashes that lasted for several days. The Birmingham riots of 1839 were significant for their role in the history of the Chartist movement, and it is said that the events of 1839 demonstrated the lengths to which authorities were willing to go to suppress the movement. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have the Brown Dog Affair. This was a controversy that arose in the early 20th century in London over the use of animals in medical research. In 1903, a statue of a brown dog was erected in Battersea, which had been used in vivisection experiments by a scientist named William Bayless. If you're unfamiliar, vivisection is defined as, quote, the practice of performing operations on live animals for the purpose of experimentation or scientific research. While I am all for the advancement of science, I do believe in ethical studies, and this clearly was not that. The statue was intended as a memorial to the countless animals that had been used in medical research, but it was met with outrage from some people. Anti-vivisection groups saw it as a symbol of animal cruelty, while some medical researchers saw it as an attack on their work. In 1907, a group of medical students attacked the statue during a protest, sparking a violent confrontation with anti-vivisection activists. The statue was eventually removed by authorities, but the controversy continued to rage on for many years. The Brown Dog Affair highlighted the deep divisions in society over the use of animals in medical research and contributed to the development of new laws and regulations aimed at protecting animal welfare. Our first stop is Italy's Colonaro Psychiatric Hospital. It's part of artist Herbert Baglion's Project A Thousand Shadows, which represents the tortured souls of those who passed in this place that still roam the halls. That's why anyone who visits this long abandoned psychiatric hospital a little outside of Parma, Italy, may be in for a fright, stumbling across the black, ghostly figures painted alongside the walls, floors, ceilings, beds, cribs, and wheelchairs. This asylum went into operation in 1873 after the cholera epidemic. This ancient palace was refurbished as a hospital for the sick and was actually meant to be a convent as a temporary setup, it was highly unprepared for what was to come or how it would stay. Inside, there were more than a thousand patients, the asylum taking in not only the mentally ill, but also orphans, homeless, addicts, vagabonds, and working girls. The corridors were thin and narrow, and the rooms were organized into small compartments, so patients were often disoriented walking the different floors, and the tiny cells immediately led to discomfort from claustrophobia. Usually, hospitalized people of this time were forgotten by everyone, as so it was as if they disappeared when they went there. Naturally, psychiatrists working in this institution were free to take advantage of that and experiment with new treatments and practices such as electroshock or frontal lobotomy. This way the doctors felt like innovators and experimenters, while patients were no longer considered people to them. Italy's ban on asylums with the Basagalia law closed this hospital in 1979. Some former inhabitants of Colonaro speak of strong noises, thuds, sounds of water and slamming doors that they heard during their silent nights there. From the psych to the pen, let's talk about Missouri State Penitentiary. It was the oldest continuously operating prison at one point, and Time Magazine once described this infamous maximum security facility as the bloodiest 47 acres in America. Opened from 1836 to 
war. In the 168 years of operation, this prison saw executions, inmate uprisings, escapes, and corruption, so much that it earned that nickname of the Bloody 47. Inmates were subject to intense abuse and neglect. A guard could whip a man for literally anything or nothing at all. Look at him wrong in line. He's having a bad day. Men in the dungeon would be beaten within an inch of their life. These 4x3 cells would sometimes have as many as 8 or more people in them. In 1937, a bill was passed in the state allowing execution by lethal gas. A total of 40 men and women were put to death in this chamber here until the capital punishment inmates were moved to a new prison. Among famous former inmates are James Earl Ray, the convicted assassinator of Martin Luther King Jr., and John B. Firebug Johnson, who earned his nickname by starting a fire there that killed several inmates. Meanwhile, on a more positive note, Charles Sonny Liston arrived in 1950, having been convicted of robbery and having learned to box while inside, won the National Heavyweight Championship in Chicago in 1953. Visitors can see the yards, tiny cells, housing units, and most chillingly, the gas chamber. A familiar name may be Jonestown, Guyana. One of America's, if not the world's as a whole's most shocking mass tragedies was the deaths of the 909 members of Jim Jones' doomsday cult. Jones started as a preacher who formed the People's Temple in Indiana in 1950s. He later moved his followers to California and then in the 70s to the remote Amazonian village in Guyana where he promised that life would be a utopia. It wasn't. It was a hellish labor camp meets tropical island. And it ended in disaster as Jones's followers fed themselves and loved ones no name brand Kool-Aid laced with cyanide. While that was happening, those who tried to escape with visiting American politician Leo Ryan were met with bullets on the airstrip. This now once promised utopia sits and decays, being swallowed back by the Amazonian rainforest. Empty living quarters, untouched workrooms and garages, a children's school, and Jones's famous preaching pavilion with his chair still front and center, they all remain. While you can visit, it is an immense amount of work to accomplish, but you'll know you arrived when you see the friendly arches and their jolly green font welcoming you to Jonestown. Call it Hotel California, except you don't want to check in. The Sanzi Resort. Their construction began in 1978 with the intent to create a modern tourist destination north of Taiwan. Doting cute color pops and pastels, all while in a quirky modular shape, these resort units would have been immensely popular if a series of tragic events combined with financial trouble and local superstition hadn't eventually led to the complete cancellation of the project in 1980, only two years after they got started. There were many stories in circulation that suggested the site of the Sanzi UFO resort was cursed. People believe that spirits of those who lost their lives in fatal construction accidents roam this site. People think that the land is actually cursed from ancient Dutch burial ground, as 20,000 skeletal remains of 17th century Dutch Dutch soldiers were found on the site, according to lore. And to add to the creepy factor, some locals are convinced that the destruction of a Chinese dragon statue that once stood at the entrance of the resort property, demolished to widen the road, led to the site being cursed and the subsequent fatal accidents. The site lay abandoned for three decades, accessed by only squatters, ghost hunters, and nature. Then sometime between 2011 and 2014, the structures were finally demolished and the site cleared. One of the scariest places in America is McPike Mansion. Tucked into the countryside of Alton, Illinois, this the Victorian mansion has a very long history of strange activity and reported paranormal phenomena. The house was built in 1869 by architect Louis Feifenberger. The original owner of the mansion was Henry Guest McPike, who owned 15 acres of land then known as the Mount Lookout Park. Here, McPike, a horticulturist, perfected his McPike grape. The family lived in this, their country home, until 1936, and then it was abandoned just like that. The house has changed hands several times since its original owner, Henry McPike, hasn't lived in it since the 1950s. The building has been home to the Browns Business College and was later owned by Paul Lashinger, who rented rooms in the house to other occupants. While it's uninhabitable, the current owners who have invested thousands of dollars into renovating the dilapidated home believe that there are dozens of spirits who maintain presence in and around the home, closing doors, throwing things, and banging around. It's readily known today for its hauntings in paranormal circles. The grounds are often visited by ghost hunters and haunted tour groups in the area, even TV shows such as Ghost Adventures. Number five, The Great Stink. <laughs> this one's fucking so funny. Where was this in Peaky Blinders? This would have been a great season. Everyone should walk it around plugging their nose. The Great Stink of London was a major environmental crisis that occurred in the summer, the real hot summer of 1858. Now at the time, the River Thames, which flowed through the heart of the city, it was heavily polluted with raw sewage, industrial waste, human shit, animal shit. 
so much shit. Pretty much everything and all horrible things you can imagine all in this flowing hot soup of garbage. The hot summer weather made the problem a thousand times worse and it caused the river to emit a putrid odor that covered the entire city. It's just a blanket of stink and depression. The stench was so overwhelming that it disrupted business. It caused widespread illness and even forced parliament to suspend its sessions. Yeah, it was so stinky, even parliament's like, Ew, no, we'll just talk later. Just go home, everyone stop. The crisis prompted widespread public outcry, I would hope, and ultimately led to the construction of a new sewer system for the entire city. Thank God, I was really hoping for some sort of solution there. The new system was completed in the 1870s and dramatically improved public health in London by reducing the incidence of waterborne diseases such as cholera. Yeah, get rid of that, clean some things up. Yeah, maybe it'll help. It took 10 years to fix the sewage. How brutal is that? Oh my God, 10 years. Number four, closer to the heart. Oh, this is so fucked up. Back in 1822, the poet Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, OG writer, here we go. Well, one of her deep dark secrets was uh, accidentally discovered. I would be haunted by this one if I found this. After the death of her husband, very sad, of course, yes. Mary kept his heart in a silk shroud in her desk. Like his actual real life heart, just wrapped up little piece of him just tucked in that third shelf down. Just slam it shut and there we go. The exact reason for this unusual act is not clear, but it's believed that Mary was deeply devoted to her husband and wanted to keep a part of him with her at all times. Or again, three cupboards down, just slammed in the back next to the Crayolas. The heart was eventually discovered by Shelley's son who removed it from the desk, thank God, and then buried it with his father's body away from the desk, like outside in the ground, something kind of normal. Again, being a fly on that wall, what does that conversation sound like? The son's like, hey, Found something, I don't know, let's talk about it. Number three, the Battle of Los Angeles. Seeing as the Pentagon had a nether leak recently, it's always fun when they leak stuff. Let's talk about the biggest false alarm ever. Or was it? The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, it happened during World War II, right at the end of February 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attacks. So everybody was obviously, you know, immensely stressed out, to say the least. Something like 25 enemy aircraft was spotted flying over Los Angeles in the late hours of February 24th. So at that point, appropriately, air raids blasted off. Blackouts were then put in effect. This was not a drill. Or was it? We don't really know yet. Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells, all blasted off, shot pointed somewhere in the sky, hopefully to hit something. In total, around 1,400 shells were shot off. Two people had heart attacks because of the noise. Five people died in total from this retaliation, and it was all apparently a false alarm. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves, and that there was nothing actually flying above. Although now we think, it was UFOs, so. I don't know, what do you guys think it was? Nothing, you think it was UFOs? Do you think it was just war nerves? I think it was probably nothing, it was just nothing. Number two, the battle of the stray dog. Oh, love animals, love when they just cause battles. That's great. The battle of the stray dog was a bizarre incident that occurred in 1925 between Greece and Bulgaria. Now it began when a Greek soldier was chasing a stray dog and he accidentally crossed the border, just a little uh, too far to the left. He crossed the border into Bulgaria, leading to a heated confrontation with Bulgarian troops. Now the incident quickly escalated into this full-blown battle Battle, again, with this dog standing in the middle, not knowing what it's caused, with artillery fire and thousands of troops on both sides running at each other. Now the conflict lasted for several days before a ceasefire was eventually declared. Now although relatively minor in the grand scheme of things, the Battle of the Stray Dog highlights the complex and often volatile nature of geopolitical tensions and the unpredictable events that can lead to armed conflicts. Like say, I don't know, a stray dog being anywhere at the wrong time. So by the time the International Committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up this obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So. Keep those leashes on, folks. You know, dog parks only, I guess. And finally, number one, the dancing plague. This is the funniest thing ever. I'll talk about this until I go out, honestly. July 1518, one of the most bizarre events in medieval history went down. And it's horrible, but humans did not help this cause. Humans were just the worst here. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and collect one summer, back in 1518, until out of nowhere, one woman 
began to dance uncontrollably in the streets. Others soon joined her and eventually there were over 400 people dancing the days away. Now it's really tragic here because this was not a good time. A good amount of people here lost their lives due to exhaustion alone. Like it sounds like a fun thing, we think back to it, it's like oh the dancing plague, people started playing music. The authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they were convulsing in the street. Again, not helpful here guys, we need some medicine, maybe something else is going on, we don't need a guy with a banjo to come up and liven up the streets while 40 people are having seizures. Not really gonna help. This happened a few times in Europe as well, a few dancing plagues between the 14th and the 17th centuries, and we still don't know exactly what happened here. All we do know is that it was some sort of illness and that it was not like Step Up. It wasn't a dance circle, it wasn't cool, it wasn't sick, all right? We don't need a guy playing guitar. This was bad, this was like a sickness. Starting our list off at number 10. Lilith. Lilith is a female demon, and sometimes she's seen as a sex goddess, so that's neat. That's a good way to start a list off right there. She first appeared in ancient Mesopotamian and Jewish folklore. In Mesopotamian mythology, she was a winged demon who preyed on pregnant women. Yeah, not so fun after all, it seems. In Jewish tradition, Lilith was believed to be Adam's first wife before Eve, who, rumor has it, refused to submit to him and left the Garden of Eden to hook up with demons. Yeah, which is a little more of a different route than what we would have done. Instead, giving birth to monstrous offspring in, you know, the underworld. I like that version more, personally. That one feels like a Thor installment. I'd watch that in IMAX. Over time, Lilith's story became associated with other beliefs. Today, it's kind of funny. She's seen as a feminist icon almost in modern times. But Lilith remains a prominent figure in various forms of literature, art, and pop culture. If you ask Siri about Lilith, it's really 50-50 about what kind of story you're gonna get. Sex goddess or demon? Who knows? Number nine, spring-heeled Jack. <clears throat> Heading to ye olden days, medieval England, spring Jack was a mysterious character slash demon slash, we have no idea, superhero? Not really sure. He emerged somewhere in the 19th century in London, England. He was described as a tall, thin, and agile figure with red eyes, clawed hands, and this one might be a little bit obvious, but he also has the ability to jump over buildings. So again, pretty obvious who he is. spring Jack was known for attacking women, but often breathing blue flames and causing them to faint or suffer from shock. Yet more than fair with the flame thing. His identity and motives still remain unknown with some theories suggesting that he was a supernatural being or possibly, hear me out, an escaped convict. Yeah, you know, he escaped by leaping out of the prison with his blue fire breath. Many believe that this was the infamous Jack the Ripper because spring Jack, Jack the Ripper, I guess they're similar, but they both became a popular figure in Victorian literature and folklore, inspiring numerous sightings and stories. And he might be a demon, so who knows. Number eight, Apophis. Apophis was an ancient Egyptian god associated with chaos, darkness, and destruction. So more of a demon, I would say, on the demon list. He was depicted as a serpent or a dragon and was believed to be the enemy of the sun god, Ra. Now Apophis was thought to reside in the underworld and he attempted to prevent Ra from completing his journey through the night sky. Yeah, what a nuisance, right? Hate when that happens. I'm trying to fly to work and then Apophis gets all up in my sh the worst. I'm like, get out of here, dude. The ancient Egyptians believed that Apophis needed to be defeated in order for the sun to rise and then fall every day. So they performed rituals and spells to protect Ra and ensure, you know, the continuation of the world. We wouldn't mind that. Apophis remains an important figure in Egyptian mythology and has been the subject of many, many artistic and literary works throughout history. Because, yeah, of course, who doesn't want to paint a demon dragon from ancient Egypt? I want to study that in school. Where was that? Number seven, Wiro. Wiro is popular in New Zealand. It's a figure in the mythology of Maori people. He's considered the god of darkness, evil, and death. Set on harming humanity. Yeah, how lovely does all those things sound? According to the Maori mythology, Wiro was one of the children of Rangiuni, the Sky Father, and Papa Tuanuku, the Earth Mother. He was born in the underworld and he was jealous of his brothers who lived in the world above. More than fair, it's all hot and stuffy down there. I'd want out too, fair. It was believed that Wiro could cause illness or misfortune to those who displeased him. So you better smash that thumbs up and hit subscribe, all that good stuff, you know, just to be safe. Never know. Number six, Lamashtu. Mesopotamian goddess of disease, infertility, and childbirth. 
birth. Nice, real tender one, this one. She was believed to be a demon who preyed upon pregnant women only. So specific and so horrible. God, some of these are kind of cool, some of them are just all bad, like this one. Lamashtu was often depicted as a female figure with a lion's head, donkey's teeth, and wings. So a little silly, but also quite terrifying. This is what happens when donkey and dragon hook up in Shrek. You get this monster coming out. It's not so fun. When it's not animated, it's disastrous. It's a monster. Lamashtu was believed to have the ability to harm people through various means, devouring them, stealing you from your home, causing you to fall ill, pretty much anything, no escaping this one. To protect against Lamashtu's influence, pregnant women were often given amulets or protective charms. Lamashtu was also associated with witchcraft and was said to have the ability to shapeshift into various animal forms, so be on the lookout for every and all of the animals. Could be demons, who knows? Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different, and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, Ride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got a watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History. Of course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird. Almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. The eyes and the... <laughs> Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now, it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan war in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells. In total, around 1,400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation. And it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah. Huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. 
more nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay, all over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now the bucket is currently on display still in Modena. So it ended up finding its forever home there. And you can go check it out if you want. That many people kicked the bucket over this bucket. History is strange, my friend. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Tichborne case. This was quite a bizarre legal case that captivated Victorian England in the 1860s and 1870s. It involved a claimant named Arthur Orton, who alleged that he was the long lost heir to the Tichborne baronetcy. Despite numerous inconsistencies in his story, Arthur managed to convince some members of the Tichborne family and a significant portion of the public that he was who he claimed to be. Be. The case went to trial in 1873 and it became a media sensation with thousands of people lining up outside the courthouse to catch a glimpse of the proceedings. This was basically like the Victorian era's OJ trial or the Johnny Depp and Amber Heard trial, you know? The people wanted to know. Despite Arthur's conviction for perjury, the case continued to fascinate the public for years to come and it became a symbol of the era's fascination with sensationalism and fraud. The Tichborne case remains one of the most infamous legal cases in British history and is a cautionary tale about the dangers of believing in something without sufficient evidence. In our number nine spot today, we have the London Beer Flood. This sounds like it would be quite a fun time, but it was anything but that and instead was a tragic event that occurred on October 17th, 1814 in the St. Giles District of London. At the Mew and Company Brewery, a massive vat containing over 135,000 gallons of beer suddenly ruptured, causing a wave of beer to flood the surrounding streets. The torrent of beer destroyed several nearby houses, killing eight people and injuring many others. The flood was so powerful that it even knocked down the wall of a nearby pub, trapping and killing some of the patrons inside. The London beer flood was caused by a combination of factors, including poor construction of the vat and overfilling it with beer. The brewery had a history of safety concerns and many of the workers were aware of the dangers associated with working there. Despite this, the brewery continued to operate and tragic struck. The incident became the subject of much media attention at the time and it continues to be remembered today as a tragic and bizarre event in London's history. The victims of the flood were commemorated with a plaque on the site of the former brewery and the incident has been the subject of numerous articles, books, and even a stage play. Not sure the logistics of that one though. In our number eight spot today, we have the Victorian bicycle craze. This is a name to refer to a period of intense enthusiasm for bicycles that swept across Europe and North America in the late 19th century. The introduction of the safety bicycle with its chain driven mechanism and rubber tires made cycling a much more accessible activity for the general public. It became a popular mode of transportation and leisure activity, particularly among the middle and upper classes. The craze also had a significant impact on fashion, with women's clothing becoming more practical and comfortable to allow for cycling. It's funny to think of now because like, it's just a bike, but at the time it was so much more than that. It's like how smartphones completely changed our lives in more ways than we probably even know. That's basically what the bike was like in the Victorian era. The bicycle craze had a profound impact on society and culture at the time. It led to the development of new industries, such as cycling clubs, and it also paved the way for the modern transportation industry. The bicycle became a symbol of freedom and empowerment, particularly for women who were able to travel further and faster than ever before. The Victorian bicycle craze remains an important cultural and historical phenomenon that changed the way people lived, worked, 
and played. In our number 7 spot today we have the Crimean War. The Crimean War was a conflict fought between 1853 and 1856, primarily involving Russia and an alliance of France, Britain, the Ottoman Empire and Sardinia. The war was fought over various territorial and religious disputes, particularly regarding the rights of Christians in the Ottoman Empire. The war was marked by high casualties, particularly from disease and poor medical care, and it is often seen as a turning point in military medicine. The war also featured some of the first extensive use of modern technologies such as telegraphs and railways, which greatly impacted warfare in the future. The war ended in a victory for the Allied forces, and it resulted in a significant shakeup of the balance of power in Europe. It also demonstrated the need for improved communication, organization, and medical care in military conflicts, and it had significant long-term impacts on military and political strategies in Europe and beyond. In our number 6 spot today we have the East End Outbreak. The East End Outbreak was an outbreak of cholera in 1866 and was a major epidemic that struck the densely populated area of East London, causing widespread illness and death. Cholera is a highly contagious disease that spreads through contaminated water, and in the Victorian era, London's water supply was notoriously unsanitary. The outbreak was particularly devastating in the East End, where poverty and overcrowding made residents more vulnerable to disease. The outbreak led to significant changes in public health policy and infrastructure, as well as increased public awareness of the importance of sanitation and hygiene. The physician Jon Snow, which you know feels like a weird name to say when I'm not talking about Game of Thrones, but the physician Jon Snow played a key role in identifying the source of the outbreak, tracing it to a contaminated water pump on Broad Street. His work really paved the way for the development of modern epidemiology and disease prevention. The the East End cholera outbreak remains a significant event in the history of public health and the struggle for social justice. It brought attention to the urgent need for clean water and adequate sanitation, and it helped to spur reforms that improved the health and well-being of people in urban areas. In our number 5 spot today we have the internment camps. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century, and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit, with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of this same kind of atrocity. It is very very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it is of course something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. In our number 4 spot today we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievably terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the very cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day. After more details came out about the incident and how the terrible working conditions were mostly to blame for the amount of lives that were lost, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like Just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically just got off scot-free. If you want to know more about this fateful day, the amazing podcast My Favorite Murder by Georgia Hardstark and Karen Kilgariff has an episode that does a wonderful job covering it. In our number 3 spot today we have Bikini Island. Bikini Island is located within the Marshall Islands and it was once the home to around 170 islanders. In 1940, the US president at the time, Harry Truman, ordered that the military test their nuclear weapons in the case of a future where they would be deemed necessary, since World War II had just ended and people were of course feeling concerned about what the future would hold. Since Bikini was located in a place where ships and planes don't normally travel 
travel very close to. Unfortunately, it was the spot chosen for this testing site. The residents of the island were asked to vacate, quote, for the good of mankind and to end all world wars, to which they of course obliged under the impression that they would one day be able to move back. After this, the testing began and in 1954, the US military detonated Castle Bravo, which is one of the most powerful weapons at 15 megatons. There were 22 other weapons that were detonated on this island as well, so it's safe to say this place got a ton of nuclear activity, which left it with extremely high levels of radiation. This left residents unable to return for much longer than anticipated, with the first returning in the 70s. But of course, shortly after these poor people moved back, they realized that the island still had totally unsafe levels of radiation, making it still unfit to live on, which has left it still uninhabited. In our number two spot today, we have strange medicine. It's not necessarily uncommon for us to hear about strange things that people in the past used to do, but sometimes those strange things are also disgusting. It was extremely common in the past for people to use human remains as a form of medicine. These gruesome treatments would consist of things such as blood, ground up human skull, and even human fat. Tomb Raiders would even steal remains in order for them to be sold to the wealthy, which is incredibly dark, and apparently mummy remains were the ideal remains for these sorts of things, which then led to a shortage of mummies. Never thought I'd be in a position where I'd be talking about a shortage of mummies, but truly anything can happen over here on Bumblebee. And finally, in our number one spot today, we have a sticky situation. Okay, so this one is less of an event, more of just a historical invention that absolutely should not have existed, and that is the sticky bomb. After the British hurriedly evacuated France in 1940, they were facing the threat of German invasion and had come up with some weapons that could be used against tanks. Thus, the sticky grenade or sticky bomb was born. It was formally called the anti-tank hand grenade number 74, and basically the design was that there was a metal outer shell that covered a bomb coated in adhesive. The idea was to have the user pull a pin to remove the metal casing, where they could then run up to a tank, use the sticky adhesive to stick it to the tank, activate the five second fuse, and get the heck out of there. Or they could just throw it and hope it's stuck. Well, there's a few problems with this design. The first one that I'm sure all of us can understand is that uh, the adhesive didn't want to stick to anything dusty or wet or muddy, which are all things that happen to be common on tanks. You know what they did like to stick to though? Human skin. Unfortunately, this invention could prove much more detrimental to the person who was attempting to use it. Despite these very obvious and dangerous flaws, it was still used by a few different armed forces, but I don't think any one has used it in recent history, which is truthfully probably for the best. Kicking off our list at number 10, the field of the cloth of gold. Way too many words right off the hop. In 1520, King Henry VIII of England, he hosted a lavish birthday celebration for, well, himself, of course, he's a king, obviously, for himself and a diplomatic summit with King Francis I of France. Two kings, one epic party. Here we go. The event took place in France and included elaborate feasts, jousting tournaments. Okay, that's pretty distracting, and displays of wealth and power by both monarchs on both sides. Now the summit aimed to strengthen the alliance between both England and France, of course, with the fun jousting happening in the corner. Again, so distracting at a banquet, but ultimately it did little to resolve their long-standing conflicts. The Field of the Cloth of Gold is remembered as one of the most extravagant events of the Renaissance period, with each monarch trying to one-up the other the entire time. It turned into an absolute joke. One king would serve dolphins and the other king would come and serve Swan. It was a lavish cook-off for 18 days straight. Yeah, the party lasted 18 days, so no one's lasting the entire time. Today, this 18-day party would have cost around $19 million, give or take a couple of swans. And dolphins? Monsters, absolute monsters. Number nine, safety coffins. Not to be confused with the safety dance, also quite fun. During the 18th century, there was a brief trend of designing safety coffins. Everybody thought they were the next Tony Stark. They wanted to make the coolest, Coffin, weird brag. To get a patent on one of these bad boys, this was next level. They were made to prevent people from, you know, being buried alive, but again, in style. These coffins were equipped with air tubes, bells, and even escape hatches, which would allow someone who was mistakenly thought to be dead to signal for help or even escape their box of death. Now, the thing is, many of these designs were very impractical or 
ineffective altogether. They were, they were bull These tubes were just a rat highway into your mouth while you were stuck in a coffin. It was horrible. God forbid you actually woke up in a coffin alive. Now you have to watch bugs and rats crawl out of this air tube until you actually did die. Some would say it's even worse than the original issue at hand. That's horrible. I'm itchy just thinking about that. Number eight, Andrew Jackson's pet parrot. I love animals. I had a bird for a hot minute there. Not the best animal in the house, but it's kind of fun. I don't know, he sucked at flying. Andrew Jackson, he was the seventh president of the United States and he had a pet parrot named Paul. Pet parrot named Paul. There we go. It's a alliteration for my theater kids over at home there. The bird became famous for its foul language, which it had picked up from its owner, of course. Now, when Jackson died in 1845, his funeral was held in Tennessee. Now, Paul, the parrot, the loyal parrot, mind I remind you, he was present at the funeral and was reportedly making so much noise that it disrupted the proceedings. Now, according to the legend, Paul was eventually removed from the funeral after swearing loudly. They're like, yeah, get your little parrot feet, get out of here, fly, shoo. That's pretty amazing, a parrot getting kicked out for swearing, that's, it sounds made up, but hopefully that one's true. That would break the tension for sure, I don't know. I can't help but get the giggles every time I'm at a funeral. I can't help it. Some historians believe this story was made up just to stain the president's history, but either way, I like it. I like to imagine a parrot being escorted out of a funeral, just like this, nice and Nice and calm, and then one brief let go at the end there. That's how you let go of a bird. You gotta go slow, and then there's that one moment of like, gah, like you have to do it, no turning back. Here he goes, he's gone. Number seven, animal court. Speaking of birds and parrots, these little mouthy things. Animal trials were a real legal practice that emerged in medieval Europe and it lasted all the way until the 18th century which is way too long for animals to be showing up in court. These trials involved pigs, cows, and even insects. Yeah, a ladybug took the stand and then just flew off at some point. These animals were charged and tried in court. The animals were often accused of crimes such as theft, taking one's life, and sometimes even witchcraft. Yeah, that's amazing. They were usually assigned a lawyer and a legal defense team, and the trials were conducted in the same way as human trials were, which is so funny. Real people had to wake up and go here. I wish I could have been a fly on the wall during one of these hearings. You know, as long as I'm not the fly on the stand, we're all good. The verdicts of animal trials varied, but many animals were found guilty and then sentenced to death by hanging or burning. Again, imagine a praying mantis being hung in the middle of town square. Like, what? who's going to watch this? Who's representing this, more importantly? The trials were often seen as a way for human beings to assert their dominance over the natural world, I guess, sure, and they were widely criticized by religious leaders and philosophers. Number six, Lake Peñor. In 1980, Louisiana's Lake Peñor was accidentally drained after a drilling rig penetrated a salt mine right beneath it, just directly beneath it. The odds here, this was crazy. What a horrible surprise down below, my god. The drilling rig was owned by the Texaco Oil Company and the accident was caused by a, of course, a miscalculation in the well's trajectory. As the drilling rig penetrated the mine, it created a hole that quickly grew in size, causing the lake to drain into the mine below. The lake drained like a massive bathtub. This event created a massive whirlpool that lasted for several hours. It pulled in trees, boats, and even a nearby drilling platform all into this watery vortex. Like something out of Pirates of the Caribbean 3, or whatever one that was where it was a massive whirlpool. It's haunting, it's the worst way to go. Remarkably, no human lives were lost in this disaster, which is so impressive. Today, Lake Peignoir has largely returned to its former state, although this time around, it's now much smaller and shallower than it once was because, you know, it got drained. How terrifying is that? Number five, the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the, well, clearly the very excited Challenger crew right before when they were walking down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. Now, this photo is chilling, but it's nice to see them happy and together. The crew even included, at the time, 37-year-old Kristen McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. You may remember this, but your parents definitely do. See, she had won a spot on the mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space program and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first ever non-military individual in space. On January 28th, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. See, two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures that morning and on live television, the world had to watch as a spacecraft broke apart and then fell into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everybody on board the craft. Now, I'm not sure if you've watched the documentary on Netflix, but it's a mini series about this whole Thing and it's powerful stuff. It's really emotional, I just finished it and it's moving. Number four, 
the core. <clears throat> this photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this photo looks relatively normal and scientific or whatever, a non-threatening photo, what he has in his hands is truly devastating. It changed history. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man. Yeah, that thing. This means that Harold is now holding the nuclear core of the atomic weapon that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast took many many lives, as well as the long-term effects of radiation illnesses. Now, it's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life-changing, world-ending device in the palm of his hand, like a literal supervillain holding kryptonite. I couldn't imagine seeing that, let alone holding it. No way. My grandmother wouldn't even hold me as a baby because I was too small and fragile. <laughs> Think she'd hold this? No way. Butterfingers. Butterfingers galore over there. Number three, the ball of burning men. January 28th, 1393, you are formally invited to a masquerade ball. How fun is that? <laughs> Who is it under that mask? Oh, it's just Taylor on Bumblebee. Love him. He's great. The French Queen Isabeau of Bavaria is now hosting one of the most lavish parties of the decade, right? So bring your finest and longest crook house. Roll it in style. Now, when the French royal court was celebrating the marriage of one of the Queen's ladies in waiting, it of course was a big deal. It's fun. It's a big happy day. For some, the best days of their lives. For others at this ball, not so great. Probably the last days of their lives. King Charles Charles VI had five companions perform a dance or a theater routine of sorts. Now they did a performance as beasts. They were committed to the bin, right? They had these big, lovely masks, big baggy outfits, lots of linen, lots of stuffing to appear as if they were real beasts. Now the party was going well, wine was spilling, people were laughing, beasts were roaring, we were committed, but one rule beforehand was put into place before the party started. Absolutely, positively, no open flames. Obviously, right? I mean, look at that guy. He looks like a couch. We're not gonna put a match near him. It's gonna be chaos. The Duke of Orleans had a little too much fun prior to this event, and he forgot the first rule of Fight Club when he arrived. The guy walked in with a lit torch. He wanted to see everyone. Some accounts say he dropped the torch by accident. Others say he got too close trying to guess the identity of said beasts. Either way, this tragic event took the lives of four people, hence the name, Ball of the Burning Men. That's terrible, imagine that, what a gig. Number two, the Stanford Prison Experiment. One of the most well-known experiments of all time was the Stanford Prison Experiment. It was an attempt to investigate the psychological effects of perceived power, and it worked. A little too well, I'd say. Guards and prisoners were all chosen randomly from college students to anyone, your neighbor, you had no idea. Nobody really knew just how bad this experiment would end up, so anyone volunteered. Those in power were taking it to an extreme level. It was absolute psychological distress. Some of the prisoners went insane. The whole exercise was abandoned after only six days, which is not a short amount of time, but historians say just six days because it was intended to last much longer. Now, it's shocking to see the lengths people go after receiving power over another human being. I thought I was evil unplugging my brother's controller and like playing, you know, and he wasn't plugged in. This is like... Next level. And finally, number one, mummified pets. Are you a pet owner? If so, comment down below which animals fill your house. We love that. Olivia and I want to get a dog so bad. I was always a dog guy growing up. My aunt had three pugs. It was the dream. I love it. Ancient Egyptians, they fancied a house pet or two. We know this. But Egyptians saw animals as incarnations of the gods, which I do too with my shih tzu, of course. The very concept of having a pet came from ancient Egyptians, so thank you. Egyptians were, of course, fans of cats. That's common knowledge at this point. But did you know they also had the same idea for hawks, lions, dogs, and baboons? Yeah, baboons. That's amazing. Go ask your parents for a baboon as a pet. There you go. I thought dogs doing their business inside was annoying, but a lion? Your arm's gonna be tired scooping that one up. Many of these animals were often mummified and buried with their owners after they had passed, just like how many owners today cremate their pets. I mean, I'm not sure I would mummify a shih tzu, but hey, whatever floats your boat. Who am I to judge? Other creatures were specially trained to work as helper animals back then. So ancient Egyptian police officers officers would use dogs and monkeys to help patrolling, then they'd mummify them. What a time, imagine that. Number 10, mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today, we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously, we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So, warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know, I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now, it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your, um, your brains. All of the brains and the mushy stuff just 
right out of your head. And then you would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians. Why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also, no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and in result, you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches, hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously, they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. It feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Mail and Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG, she was a champ, she was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury. So later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around, comes around. Like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god Juno and they protect 
women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. In our number five spot today, we have the Italian Renaissance dark side. Just at the tail end of the years of the medieval period, as we transitioned into the Renaissance period, began the Italian Renaissance. When we think of the Italian Renaissance period, it is known for the development and the rebirth that it caused, which makes a lot of sense, considering the word Renaissance means rebirth. But there is one less glamorous and slightly frightening side to this period that isn't always spoken about. Sailors, who had been returning from the New World at this point brought something less than lovely back with them, and that was syphilis, which spread through an entire French army. After this, the troops brought what was called the Great Pox to the rest of Europe. Since there was no penicillin back then, the disease spread rapidly and the symptoms were pretty gruesome. It would often happen that the person who had fallen ill would have the skin on their faces essentially be rotting away, which would leave large ulcers. Sometimes people's noses or lips would be pretty much gone. On, and it happened often that people would very sadly pass away from the disease. So basically, what we think of as a really beautiful time in Europe was both world changing, but also very scary and like, I don't know, kind of close to a zombie apocalypse. In our number four spot today, we have William the Conqueror. In 1087, William the Conqueror decided to take on an all alcohol diet. This is because he was suffering from extreme obesity and was struggling because of that fact. Because of this, he told his staff that he would only drink wine until his weight went down, but he ended up passing away less than a year later. And most of us are told that obviously this was because of the wine only diet. That's actually not true. In an astonishing turn of events, this wine only diet actually worked. Shortly after beginning his diet, he was able to ride his horse again, which was one of the main reasons he started the diet in the first place, as he was previously too heavy for the horse to carry. He actually died after falling from his horse during an expedition, which was completely unrelated to either his weight or his diet. It's entirely possible that had he not gone on this diet, he would have never ridden his horse and maybe would have lived longer? Truthfully, who knows? But I suppose in a very roundabout way, he did still kind of die from his wine only diet. In our number three spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed and during the time her son was too young to rule just yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out by using scalding hot water. Yeah. Don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it really doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. It seemed like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slang, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from. She divided a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she definitely was not okay. In our number two spot today, we have Mansa Musa. Mansa Musa was a deputy to the ruler of the Mali Empire, but when the ruler went missing while on a sea voyage to find the edge of the Atlantic Ocean, Mansa Musa became the ruler in 1312. During during his rule, European nations were really struggling due to civil wars and a lack of resources, but the Mali Empire was flourishing because of their abundance of resources like gold and salt. Under his rule, the empire grew to take up a large portion of West Africa as he conquered 24 cities and their surrounding districts. At this time, Mali was one of the top producers of gold in the entire world, which left Mansa Musa as one of the wealthiest historical figures ever. One of the most well-known 
events during his rule was the pilgrimage to Mecca. This journey took place from 1324 to 1325 and spanned an estimated 4,000 miles, and it was the first time people outside of the empire saw just how wealthy he was. He traveled with 60,000 of his men, all wearing Persian silk, along with 12,000 slaves who each carried four pounds of gold bars, and he also brought heralds who had golden staffs, along with a bunch of camels and horses. This pilgrimage had a profound effect on Egypt as this huge group of people passed through. From the markets in Cairo, to the royals, to the impoverished people that crossed their path, Musa left Cairo littered with so much gold that it depreciated the value of the metal in Egypt and it took decades for them to recover. In our number one spot today, we have St. Marcellus's Flood. This was actually a very serious extratropical cyclone that swept through around January 16th, 1362. This cyclone eerily matched up with the new moon and it spanned through the British Isles, the Netherlands, Northern Germany, and Denmark. Here's the thing, this storm not only lined up with the moon, but also peaked on the feast day of St. Marcellus, which is the reason it got its name, but usually people refer to this one as the second because there is another. The first St. Marcellus flood took the lives of 36,000 people as it swept through the northern Netherlands in 1219. The second flood, however, while no one is sure the exact numbers, it is estimated that at least 250,000 people lost their lives. While there have been plenty of devastating floods in history, this one is said to be blamed on Atlantic gales and that this event goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. Starting off this list, in our number 10 spot, we have the Rhode Island Vampire. In the late 1800s, tuberculosis was spreading rapidly in Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Vermont. This obviously would have been pretty terrifying for the residents of these places, but things quickly took a very dark turn. Since many of the people who were passing away from this illness appeared very obviously ill with sunken, drained faces, for some reason, the logical response was that people believed they had been the prey of vampires. There was a family in Exeter, Rhode Island that had multiple people pass away from the illness, so then people believed that someone in the family must be feeding the vampire. They even went as far as to exhume the bodies of some of the deceased family members to make sure that they weren't undead. One of the exhumed bodies had passed away more recently, so her body was in a better condition, which people of course took as a sign of her being a vampire. This led them to burn her heart and liver and then mix the ashes with water. This is most definitely a crime today and pretty scary, but to make things even worse, they gave this concoction to other people in the town who had fallen ill as some kind of a cure. Imagine having to drink that and then still having tuberculosis after. Definitely not a good trade off. In our number nine spot today, we have the history of dentures. Personally, I don't have a ton of experience with dentures, but they seem to be a pretty straightforward thing these days, aside from the cost of dental, of course. But things weren't always the way that they are today. Instead of dentures being made of fake teeth before, they used to be made with real human teeth, which is absolutely disgusting. After the Battle of Waterloo, scavengers went and took the teeth off of corpses, which is quite a job, and then they sold these teeth to dentists. The dentists would boil the teeth, chop the roots off, and then attach these teeth to ivory base plates and then sell them to customers. Aside from this being an extremely morally questionable practice in its entirety, it's also just very creepy. In our number eight spot today, we have the smallpox spread. I'm sure at some point or another, most of us learned about smallpox and the epidemic, which is something that we luckily don't really have to worry about much anymore. But one thing a lot of people explained that they didn't know was how badly it devastated indigenous peoples. Europeans who came over to America brought with them a multitude of diseases that they would have had some immunity to, considering it was likely their bodies had encountered it before. But this was not the case for those already living on the land that is now referred to as North America. Indigenous Americans not only had no immunity towards this disease, but also the traditional ways of treating illness may have only exacerbated the symptoms. Because, of course, how could you possibly know how to treat something that you've literally never seen before and with no help from the people who do actually know how? It has been estimated that the spread of disease caused the population of indigenous Americans to decline by 70%. There is a theory that the spread of disease may have been one of the only things that led to the colonization of North America. In our number seven spot today, we have the Tulsa riot. This event occurred on May 31st and June 1st of 1921, and it has actually been called the single worst incident of racial violence in American history. This happened in the Green
Greenwood District of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and basically just mobs of white racist people went out and attacked black residents and businesses. What started this was when a 19 year old black man named Dick Rowland was accused of harming a white girl and he was subsequently arrested and there were rumors that he was going to be lynched. This of course drew a bunch of racist white people out of their homes to participate, but then a group of around 75 black men showed up to make sure that he didn't get lynched. One thing led to another and a firefight broke out that led to 10 of the white people and two of the black people being killed. After this, all hell broke loose. In 2020, the last living survivor of the massacre, R&B and jazz saxophonist Hal Singer, a total legend, passed away at the age of 100. In the same year, this massacre finally became a part of the Oklahoma State curriculum, and it's about time, only a century too late. In our number six spot today, we have Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus was an ancient Greek philosopher who helped push the notion that the universe is in constant change, as well as the unity of opposites where the universe is a system of balance exchanges. This is all fine and well, but where things get a little troublesome is in his own personal life. You see, the thing is, is that he was a misanthrope, and his dislike for humankind led him to having long stretches where he was quite isolated. He would wander through the wilderness alone, surviving on plants and other things that he could scavenge. In the end, he came down with a pretty terrible and painful illness called dropsy, which is an accumulation of fluid underneath the skin. Doctors were unfortunately unable to help him, so he took matters into his own hands. He decided to cover himself in cow dung under the belief that as it dried, it would draw the moisture out from under his skin. This could have been a genius idea, albeit super gross, but things took a very, very dark turn. Covered in the dung, he laid out in the sun to dry, but the dung created a body cast and left him unable to move. This inability to move also left him unable to shoo off the pack of wild dogs that ended up surrounding him. So unfortunately, he was eaten alive. I guess I can understand why this one may have been left out of history class. Oh look, it's the D-Bags day off. Camp staff, check out this jolly go lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the wartime, that must have been awesome, especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility. Maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other, maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them. In fact, I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is going to have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II to do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for following orders. These young adults who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder, it's not that far in the past and these people most likely took lives shortly before or after this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yes, yeah, so um, I chose this photo out of trust me like thousands of equally creepy ones because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Clausen of Ernach and the surrounding area Appenzell custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrast such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Claus that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells and very various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupal meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring, and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw, and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip, however, in times of poverty and hunger, which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money, and in the 1930s, what was known as Belchel Claus, aka the Beggar Claus, began to appear on the streets. Essentially homeless Santa Clauses, but Santa looked like that. As a result, the influx of beggars in the Claus Guide resulted in heavy restrictions, and in the 1950s, the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous 
enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified, but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the Children of God leader, David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access, horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a b would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose, and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926 to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929 to 45. 45, and in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout, unbridled, through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands to death and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo from the LAPD Collective. And it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car window. Window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte and they were hunting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad, James Alroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law, Tudor Scherer, hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that would probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Scherer trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone, and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety, and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Mabel is struck on the head, left gagged and bleeding in the hallway. The group ransacks her home for a safe that never exists and panic when there is none, so they just leave her there. Mabel is dead for two days in her home before she's found. The investigation into the slaying of the Burbank widow began and it was a long one, filled with drama. In the end, the four are charged with conspiracy to commit burglary, robbery, and M-word on June 3rd, 1953, in the death of Miss Mabel Monahan. <laughs>